and welcome to the February 8th Governance and Priorities Committee meeting. I'd like to first recognize that we're on the traditional territory of the Sanema First Nation. Our clerk today is Ms. Sheila Gurry, and today's Governance and Priorities Committee meeting will be held in accordance with the Community Charter Council Procedure Bylaw 2018 number 7272 and Ministerial Order number M192 governing open meetings during a state of emergency and the provincial health order regarding gatherings and events. Therefore, members of the public are required to observe meetings virtually and not attend in person, and question period will be suspended throughout the duration of the provincial health order in effect. Um, item number two is the introduction of late items, and I believe we have two. Yes, thank you, Chair. For late items today, we're adding the governance and priority priorities committee agenda planning um, PowerPoint, as well as the 2021 Association of Vancouver Island and Coastal Communities resolutions. So we're adding the proposed resolutions that we received from Council. And that's it, Chair. Thank you. And there are no other additions to the agenda? I see that. I would then uh, ask for a motion for the adoption of the agenda as amended. Councillor uh, Mayor Krogh, Councillor Hemmons. All those in favor, raise your hands. Any opposed? Councillor Armstrong, I understand that you're visiting us via Zoom. Um, I'll just That's correct, in favor. I'll just assume that you're in favor of any motions unless you yell out at us. Perfect. Okay. Um, item four, motion for adoption of minutes as circulated. <laughs> Councillor Thorpe, seconded by Councillor Hemmons. All those in favor, raise your hands. Any opposed? Seeing none. Ah, there you are. Um, that is passed, and now we're on to number five, Agenda Planning, Governance and Priorities Committee Agenda Planning, and uh, Ms. Sheila Gurry will be introducing this. Thank you, Chair. I just have a couple of slides to go through with you today, but I basically want to turn it over to you for discussion throughout these slides. In your agenda package today is included um, the regular agenda planning package, which includes the future schedule of um, GPC um, meetings. The next upcoming ones for February as well as March are included on page 15 of your agenda. Page 16 of your agenda provides the um, calendar and as well as, I just want to note that after today's um, meeting, there are only 15 GPCs left for the remainder of 2021. There's also the future topics list that's included in your agenda and the future meetings topics framework. And this framework was discussed last year at a GPC we had on GPCs. And it decided, um, you all decided kind of how to, each topic that you wanted to go through, what would be um, the format for that meeting based on the desired outcome that you saw um, for that topic. So going through today, I just wanted to note, like I said, the upcoming meetings, that there's 15 meetings left. Reimagine Nanaimo, as you all know, is part of each GPC meeting as a standing item, um, as it is um, in place of the Reimagine Steering Committee. The GPC acts as the steering committee for Reimagine Nanaimo. And other topics that are on your list can be added to the schedule, or the schedule could be altered upon Council's request. So some topics for today's discussion just around the GPCs in general. Um, I think that there is um, some desire to prioritize the future meeting topics on the list that is attached to your agenda. And some other questions for you all is, would you like to make time to brainstorm and discuss ideas through um, a roundtable discussion at these GPC meetings? I think there is some um, desire for that as well. So um, if that was to happen, I think um, I, I would recommend that there be a time limit so, so that um, any discussion you have, it can go on and on and on. So if you do want to forward something, what is the result? So the then what after your discussion? Do you want to forward it to a, a future GPC for further discussion? Do you want to put a motion forward for a future meeting? And any ideas that you decide to move forward, um, I would prefer and need a motion for that after the discussion period. And any other items that you would wish to discuss regarding the GPC? Yep. 
Thank you for that. Um, um, just a little slight pause there. Councillor Thorpe is helping me with my uh, computer issues, which he usually does. I, yes, I think I, I paused for Councillor <laughs> yes, yes. Turley. I think Councillor Turley has a question, so I, I paused for him. Thank you. You're up. Sir. Oh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, the one issue or a topic that I think, and is, is I don't believe would be a long discussion, but uh, should be done sooner than later, is um, the one review of street entertainers regulation, because come May, June, July, August, that's when uh, things could hit the fan again, and it'd be nice to be able to have um, at least a presentation given to us from um, some of the property owners in the downtown core as to what their wishes are and um, any um, other things that could be tweaked in the bylaw so that we don't end up with the mess we had last year. So, thank you. And were you looking um, for changes um, to the bylaw? Well, what I would like to have is a presentation from at least one of the property owners. Uh, Bob Moss has indicated he has some suggestions and he owns several buildings downtown. Um, and just just some general information on how it can be improved so that we don't end up with because uh, right now there it, it's it's a little vague i guess is the best way of putting it as to whether or not you know it's the the noise is a is an issue or the noise isn't an issue and and there are some areas of uh in in some bylaws that don't meld well with the this particular bylaw and i think trying to work, work them together to try to uh, have at least a, a one um, a type of, of bylaw that, that covers everything on, on the same level. So, anyway. so time-wise is, is, you know, if we could do it in March or early April, that'd be great. Anybody else? Ah. I believe Zoom is uh, Councillor Armstrong. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just on that, we did at the previous council make a motion to have the whole bylaw re, re looked at. So I know we discussed it before and it was the motion was found. So that is being looked at. It's supposed to. And then my second, I have two things I would like to uh, fast forward. One being crosswalk safety, because I think that's something we hear a lot about. And I think we really need to look at that one. I think that's really important to me. And the other one, <clears throat> excuse me, especially with the impact of new development coming in as neighborhood associations and the role they play in our uh, decision making. Thank you for that. Next, I have Councillor Martin. I was just hoping that we would be able to visit it this year as the election is next year. And that's to do with the election signage. I don't think it would be a complex, but I would like to bring forward options for us to review and to see what's available. Thank you. Councillor Thorpe. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, so on this lengthy list, there's I think most of them are, are of importance. Um, there's some more so and less so to me personally. Uh, that doesn't matter. Uh, there's a couple of items I was going to, to offer as possible ideas, and I think maybe they're related. One is, um, and I know we have homelessness and addictions at number 15 on our list. Uh, not a priority 15, but it's on our list as 15. Um, not quite the same as that, but we've, we constantly hear concerns from our downtown business people, most recently Victoria Crescent, uh, Old City Quarter, uh, Commercial Street, and I wondered if this might be a forum to invite representatives from those areas uh, or downtown businesses in general to come and simply um, explain to us what their frustrations are, do a little bit of venting, I guess is the word, and maybe brainstorm a little bit uh, for ways that we can support them. So I would like to uh, just put that out there as a thought. And related to that, but uh, separate, uh, I'm, I'm understanding that we have a new downtown business association forming or formed, and, and to this point, we've heard almost nothing about it. Uh, maybe Councillor Turley can fill me in, but I'd be very interested in knowing uh, who's on that and have a presentation from them for education. Thank you. 
I have next Councillor Brown. <clears throat> thank you, Worship. Uh, or thank you, Councillor Bonner. Um, there's lots on this list that I would like to have conversation, but I, there's two actually, or one that I want to focus on because I, I think it relates in terms of engagement, and I, I do think we need to get that neighborhood associations, GPC, and whatever path forward figured out. Um, I think that's pretty crucial, especially as we're undergoing the reimagined and IMO process. And also tied to that, um, I'm not sure where this is at, but around engagement, and I, I again saw it in this report, was uh, when we, there was the decision around the youth council and we put it out there to engage with uh, uh, the youth on how they would like to be engaged. And I think that's probably very crucial to follow up uh, on sooner rather than later as we move into phase two of the, re the reimagined and animal process. Ms. Gurry. Thank you, Chair. I can give some comments and then um, ask Council a possible way forward with this priorities list and these topics. Um, very easy um, to rearrange based on the discussion we're hearing today. And I'm wondering if Council wishes staff to come back with kind of um, filling in of these um, um, of, of this matrix, this framework, based on your priorities to see if it works for you going forward. Maybe that could be the next GPC agenda planning conversation at our next meeting. We go back with your prioritized items and we um, fill out what we think we're hearing you would like and then you can make any tweaks that you see. And then based on obviously resources and staff timing, we'll bring those topics forward as, as soon as we practically can. Um, so that's just one um, note I wanted to make. Um, I think Councillor Turley might have an update on the BIA, but I can tell you from the staff's point of view, Council did give us direction to proceed. So the next step would be to go out for the vote um, on that and then have the bylaw come to Council. So the, um, the vote um, on joining of the BIA, of the um, membership of the BIA, and um, then the bylaw is the next steps. So that is... Um, that's the process and that's where we're at with that. Councillor Turley may have more to add. The Youth Council, um, I did look into where we were at with that. There was a motion and um, there was a lot of work done between communications, parks, recreation and culture, as well as um, community planning section who used to look after the Youth um, Council committee when there when it was up and running so between them there was a lot of brainstorming and ideas as to the next step forward how to really engage with youth on how they want to be engaged was um an interesting um proposal we were trying to or they were trying to figure out ways forward with that as well as defining what youth is um, parks recreation culture has a different age group for youth than community planning had an age group for youth and so they were working and doing a lot of brainstorming and work on that and then COVID happened so that is um, being reactivated and that is definitely something that can come back to the GPC for more discussion and it probably does tie into that neighborhood associations discussion as well. I have uh, next Councillor Turley's and then Hammond Turley. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick answer. Uh, thanks for the information, um, Ms. Gurry. Um, the only other piece of information is that the the only thing that has been formed right as today is a society that will administer the BIA funds, and I don't have the list of people off the top of my head, but I can certainly get it for you. Uh, however, you have to understand that that could be a total moot point if if the uh, vote goes in, in not in favor of forming a BIA uh, funding. Um, if it does, then obviously the, the uh, society is the one that will be administering and bringing all the appropriate um, information to the city on a year, I think it's a yearly basis they have to bring a uh, financial statement. And, and the one thing I just want to make sure everybody's clear on is that the 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 this particular the BIA is is designed so it does not cost, and I say with quotation marks around it, the city any money. It's a self tax of the prop commercial property owners within a specific boundary, uh, and the city does take uh, off any costs. and And I'm not sure how those costs are determined, but uh, there may be staff time that isn't included at that I don't know uh, from the first check for the first year that comes off. So 
the actual vote technically is not supposed to cost the city any money, uh, but it has to be done through the city because it's involving uh, property taxes as self-assessed ones. So I don't know if you need any other information. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dury. Next is Councillor Hammonds. Thank you. Um, a few things. So one, I heard Ms. Gurry asking, is this a good format? And perhaps we can identify our top out of this list of um, 22. I, would it make sense to pull out our top five? And then is the idea that staff would, would fill this out and bring it back to us? And then we would have a dialogue on whether those outcomes are what we were hoping for? Um, exactly. I think that would work. Um, be the most efficient. Uh, we take what you're saying today, do our best to fill it in, but then bring it back to you to basically make sure it's what you're looking for. Um, make sure we're on the same page. Make sure the desired outcomes are exactly what you're looking for, and then um, go forward from there. Okay, thank you. So if I were to identify my priorities, um, the neighborhood associations, I agree with Councillor Brown, that's a um, that's kind of the bread and butter of how we engage. And so I'd like to get that one going. Um, uh, one Port Drive is, is high on my list. Um, and, my, and regarding the youth, um, I know that we had an earlier motion looking at that, and Ms. Gurry, you just gave a great explanation. I also understand that the school district and Paul Manley's office are also doing initiatives around youth engaging around government issues, and I just wonder if there's an opportunity for collaboration rather than us creating one and Paul create one and you know uh, the school district create one, et cetera, et cetera. I think Councillor Brown has a response. I do know part of the motion actually did include the school district, ah. Councillor Hemmons, so yes, and that was part of the brainstorming and discussions that were in initially taking place with staff, so definitely we would look into that and report back to you in that discussion if okay. there was a better way. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. So those are mine, and um, to number six, I've shared with you guys before that um, I don't know that we need a GPC on women's participation on city committees, but I do have an idea around embedding some different language in all of our terms of reference. And I've, Ms. Gurry and I have gone back and forth, back and forth a little bit on that. So um, I'm not sure that's, that's one potentially we could take off. Um, my last point, I'm rambling here, is we have the upcoming GPC on the Health and Housing Action Plan, and I'd love to hear from my colleagues how they would like that structured, who they would like there, what, like, what kind of information would you like Dawn and I to be ready to present you with in order for you to feel comfortable with that plan? That's it. Thank you for that. Very good suggestions. Um, I don't see anybody else on the speaker's list. Um, I guess one of the questions that will affect how these come to us is, is how far staff is along in actually working on many of these topics. Like, uh, um, are we expecting... Um, say a building permit review to show up in the next two months, um, that sort of thing. Um, further to your framework for future topics, which is the next item is, council will remember that we discussed this framework and we added, I think, the outcomes um, section to it, of what we were expecting to, re to happen at the end of these meetings. So um, is, does this format still work for everyone? And if that's the case, then we'll, as we go through this list and prioritize this list, we'll also need a list of outcomes uh, that, we're, that council is expecting to happen at the end of the meeting, I guess, or shortly thereafter. Am I seeing that just correct way of viewing it? Thank you, Chair. The only other thing I'd maybe add for outcomes is it might not be that day an outcome unless the outcome is to um, proceed with a staff report or proceed with more information or to have such and such come back and so there might be like additional um, um, additional days or things to do to achieve the ultimate outcome but yes the outcome for that day is how I think you should look at that so the do you need a motion for us to proceed or did you is, is hearing what we've said I Based on the priorities list, I don't think I need a motion. I just, um, the, second, the second matter that Councillor Armstrong Strong mentioned, um, I didn't quite catch it. So what I have is um, the street entertainers, entertainers regulation bylaw, neighborhood associations, 
crosswalk safety, one port drive, election signage, and homelessness and addictions, but more with the um, Victoria Crescent business owners coming to present on their current issues and frustrations and possible brainstorming of ideas coming forward. I have that. Um, I have had communications with Councillor Hammonds on the women's participation on City of Nanaimo task forces and committees. So um, I can bring back an, an update on that. But basically, we have a committee and task force operating guidelines that I've been meaning to bring to you for some time for updating. And I think putting it in there and including something in all of our terms of reference, having you approve it all, that like you, Council, approve it, um, I think would satisfy that motion as Councillor Hammond said, and so what am I missing? Uh, Councillor Armstrong? Um, <clears throat> for me, when you talk about the homelessness and addiction, I don't think it should just be Victoria Crescent. It should be open up to anybody in the community that wants to speak about it. We hear it a lot from different associations, so I believe that should be an open topic that involves all of the city, just not one particular group which we quite often hear, that's what we cater to. So I, I personally would like to see that. And my second point is I think for the topics that we want to see done, I think we should fit, fit, fit or do the framework and then send it forward. And I think that would eliminate a lot of extra time because if you come back and I say, well, no, that's not what I meant. This way you'll know what I meant or whatever council, other councillors meant and we can present it all at once. So we don't have to spend a lot of time going back and forth on it. So you are, are you suggesting that individual counselors would fill in the framework for their particular choices or desires? Councillor Armstrong? I can't hear anything. Sorry, I can't hear anything. It's going in and out. Uh, Councillor Armstrong, can you hear me? Yes, you're the only one I can hear. Everybody else bounces in and out. So are you suggesting, Councillor Armstrong, that councillors would fill out that format and um, send it to us to then include in your agenda so, so um, you're not spending time here at the meeting working out what you really meant? Is that what you were saying? Yes, because I believe that if we all do that, we're going to see the commonalities and that way we'll, we'll go a lot faster than saying, well, I didn't mean that, and then we get into a great big discussion again. I'd like to pre-do this so that we're not wasting time. We've already done this once before, so. Mr. Rudolph, you are up next. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Mr. Mr. Chair, just a couple of comments. So uh, firstly, this is moving this agenda planning topic to the beginning of the agenda. So uh, this came out of a previous workshop that you had, and if this is, uh, Unless we hear otherwise, we will continue to do that as the first start. Uh, it would make it more effective, I think, if we were a little more certain about what's coming up. And, and you know, there's a list, but then there's the agenda building for the future. I think somebody said uh, part of this is when is staff ready to bring it forward? So we've got a couple on the topics list here right now is uh, reimagine, you know, is sort of getting that ready to the place where it was ready to come and same with the amenity policy. And there's certain things where we are certainly on the list of projects where we're ready and need to bring it in and need to schedule those things in. We do at the staff level uh, attempt to plan out as much as two months ahead in terms of what we anticipate or set targets for when these, uh, these major topics are coming so that they don't all land up on the same day and unfortunately sometimes that happens but so just from a agenda management point of view sort of we get instead of ebbs and flows more of a constant uh, flow to council so if we could populate this uh, calendar a little more with your input in terms of the next couple months and maybe even beyond uh, that would give all of us uh, some certainty as and, and any interest party that might want to know for example the neighborhood associations if you'd like to have a day well they, they need to have a couple months notice probably just to get organized so it's good to be as clear as possible on those types of things one of the things on this that uh, I think you've also talked about is e when, it, when each of these topics comes along in addition to what are you trying to get accomplished with it the, the back end of it is are there engagement parties that you'd want to bring in as part of that and anticipate that and maybe send out invitations or something like that so it's a bit structured so I think that's come up and as far as the uh, there's another t part of this that's not in this 
the set of information. It's the free flowing of ideas and uh, sort of the council roundtable part. And in addition to whatever's on the list, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? And does that get scheduled into a GPC? Or there's a bit of, I think we've had a bit of a trial run on that in the past, but is there any way we could structure that part of this, in addition to what's on the list, new items that could be put on some sort of a framework so you could have a conversation? And uh, again, what would be the intended outcomes of that? So that's that's a bit of unfinished business, I think, with this, if, you, if you're following me. so it's. Do we do, in addition to list of topics and so on, do we want to have a bit of a, when I say we, I just, the council, we and everybody in these meetings have a time where you have a little more flexibility or is it, you know, you prefer the certainty type of thing or do you want one once in a while, a special workshop just to brainstorm things in addition to everything else that we have. So that's a big, that's a big topic. Um, so uh, just again, Moving this agenda to the this as far, part of the first part, uh, getting a longer list of certain dates for these big topics so that we can build out a couple of months in advance. Uh, this whole piece around engagement uh, and being mindful of that, and then the flowing of you know more of a, a free flowing opportunity so that you could. Uh, and I'm not sure if you know how you want to handle this, but it would be more of a test drive or have a brief conversation to see if you, if there would be a consensus that you'd like to spend more time on that topic and sort of once in a while uh, brainstorm that out. Even it doesn't have to be every meeting; it could be like quarterly or something like that. So, just some thoughts. Thank you, Councillor Gessenbrock. Thank you, Chair. Um, through you, um, first, uh, I really like uh, the priorities list and having that list and I think we've been doing this in the past but um you know if if as new ideas that are not new ideas but as things that staff are bringing forward can show up on that priorities list even if they're a way out like this is something we've been thinking about coming to the GPC then each GPC we can see sort of that updated priorities list and sort of see kind of in, in the flow where things are starting to percolate and you know the next month it could jump you know, closer to having a date and see in relation to council priorities. And then, you know, if there's a moment at each GPC where if somebody has a comment to make on that priorities list and, you know, feels that something should be earlier or, or moved back or whatever, that can be addressed, addressed then. Um, and then just in terms of the uh, structure um, that table that has uh, the different items. Um, I think uh, with regards to that and, and the round table, um, if I understand this correctly, I think that for each GPC there should be a little bit of time and um, you know we can set a bound on it, but say if a council member um, does have a GPC item they want to bring forward, that's when they can come bring that idea forward um, hope, I think that they should have spent a little bit of time, you know, figuring out those boxes within the structure to like help bound that conversation. They can put that forward. We have a discussion around the boxes, whether this is a worthwhile idea, we, we discuss it and then have a vote um, on whether we want this officially added or not. And then when we do that, staff will then have an idea of what our expectations are around it and that there's consensus around the table that this has got enough support to go forward. Am I understanding that clearly is sort of like what staff are thinking about that how this process rolls? Um, through you chair, yes I think you have it exactly right. So moving this agenda planning process to the start of the meeting um, first, um, I think that there might be some desire to spend some more time on this. Um, probably limiting it to about a half an hour time, but like Mr. Rudolph said, maybe quarterly you could have more time and more discussion, or if it's needed, um, more discussion. Yes, um, put your ideas out there, have some discussion, get to some sort of consensus on it and a motion at the end of that. You can use filling out the, the boxes um, on that um, framework for those discussion ideas to kind of flush them out and then proceed further um, down the road. Um, and yeah, have that roundtable discussion, have your ideas, talk about them, and then moving forward, a motion to move forward either to have them at a future GVC meeting 
or a staff report or et cetera. So you have it exactly how I was kind of envisioning you might want to see this. Um, and if that's not correct, yeah, this now's the time to hear from you um, as well in that framework piece when we did have that discussion last year, the format was kind of around the engagement. So did you want to have the stakeholders come in? Did you want to hear from the public? Did you want a presentation from staff or staff report? So what kind of format did you want to delve into that topic with? So um, that was that part of the box um, that we kind of came up with the word format when you were all talking about that part of a meeting. So um, yeah, our questions today is, do you want the um, agenda planning at the start of a meeting? Do you want to have a roundtable discussion? Do you want, um, is this framework working for you? Prioritizing your topics and Council Gesselbrock, we staff do add some of the things that are upcoming on that list, like the, the building permit review, um, that's coming forward, that's a staff item. And then I think some of the staff um, items that have been brought to GPC have led to further um, GPC discussions that Council wishes, like the tra um, traffic or crosswalks that fed in from a transportation presentation you had. So some of staff's items have, um, have led to your desire for future um, GPC meetings and topics. And just generally how it's working for you and what tweaks would you like um, to be made in order for it to be um, the best meeting for you. Thank you. I have Councillor Thorpe next. Thank you, uh, Chair. Just a couple of additional thoughts, if I may. Um, so personally, I, I think this is developing into a really good forum for, for bringing forward topics. I like the idea of a round table. I like the idea of having this at the top of the meeting, but I would suggest a time limit. Um, uh, just to reference a couple of uh, items that have been mentioned, for me, I think the uh, neighborhood associations uh, should be a priority and the street entertainers, as Councillor Turley said, the summer season is, is approaching. So I think that's important. Um, items like One Port Drive and the Waterfront Walkway are extremely important to me, but I sort of assume that when there is something significant to report that staff will, will bring that forward at that time. So. Um, as I think you've indicated, there, there's a lot going on that we're probably not even aware of that staff are working on, and when they have things ready to tell us uh, and updates, they, they will do so. Um, just to clarify for um, Councillor Armstrong, when I mentioned the um, Victoria Crescent Association, my intent was not to, to limit it to that uh, group, uh, but really have a forum for any business people uh, throughout the city who feel that they have been affected by what we have to acknowledge is a problem uh, of uh, street people and uh, the addiction and mental health issue that, that uh, often goes with that. And we spend a lot of time trying to problem solve and, and, and so we should help the people that are afflicted uh, with those illnesses or uh, with homelessness, but, but we have to recognize the harm it's doing to our business community. And so if nothing else, I felt it might be worthwhile to have a forum where uh, representatives could come. And I guess I, I was thinking of sort of a pre-COVID uh, scenario. Uh, it's harder via Zoom, but it could still happen. And simply hear their, their concerns, hear their frustrations, let them get some stuff off their chest and talk about what we could do to support them and what we're unable to do. Uh, I just think it might be a worthwhile conversation and allow people uh, in the business community that are being negatively impacted uh, to have a chance to express their frustrations and we can sit and take it. Um, so that was my intent with that, not to limit it to one area or group. Thank you. Thank you. Your Worship. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, when we started down this road with the Governance Priorities Committee, uh, I thought that this would be a, a wonderful forum to be able to have the kinds of discussions that uh, in other times and before the rules got stiff, you know, people would have sat around a table and as Councillor Hemmons once suggested, why can't we just go and have a beer? Uh, well, we can't really do that. If we get five of us in a room, then we have to look to Miss Gurry to decide whether or not we're actually having a meeting or it, it's terribly formal. I would like to think there would be some kind of a session and it may well have to be in camera because it would involve discussing 
uh, money and priorities, but this is the Governance and Priorities Committee meeting. And it's prompted to some extent, Chair, by the question you asked me today, what do you hope to see at the end of four years? We have a number of things underway, projects we are considering uh, that involve capital, programs, all kinds of things which I won't articulate here uh, for fear of discussing something we might have already mentioned in camera, but I think it would be important to ha just have the, uh, the session where we talk about things and then start to arrive perhaps at some general sense of given fiscal restraints or the potential of, uh, of a referenda, whatever, that we just talk about what do we hope to achieve at the end of four years? Uh, and what is it? Uh, a much more free-flowing discussion. As much as I love structure and order and, and come out of the legal profession where we really like to be bound by rules, I just think that that would be a really useful session. Uh, we may discover we have very differing views about what we think is important, but uh, when I consider all the projects that are, are well known in this city and publicly discussed, whether it's a, an Oliver Woods facility in the South End or the Waterfront Walkway or getting on with uh, some of the priorities, One Port Drive, that are on this list, I don't think we've ever had that kind of free-flowing kind of discussion. So I throw that out there as a priority for me, is to be able to have that kind of discussion at least once in the next few months, just so we get a sense of where we maybe have either unanimity or complete disagreement, or maybe I'm completely off base by even suggesting this. Nobody's told me that. Uh, but I think I'd like to hear it from the council, uh, just because I think it's incredibly useful. And, you know, staff are working away now on all kinds of projects uh, to which they've been assigned or things that are coming to council. Um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty wonderful team, but like, what is it? Because we're gonna have, we can't have it all. And I don't think we're going to figure out what we really want unless we hear from each other. And, and as opposed to either individual counselors coming in and sitting down with me in my office, which I'm always thrilled to have happen, uh, but to have that discussion in an open forum. And that's what, for me, the GPC should have incorporated and being understood to be part of its real mandate was that kind of free-flowing discussion, not terribly structured. Sometimes it's okay to be unstructured. So I throw that out for what it's worth, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Thanks, Your Worship. Um, feels like we're talking about a lot of different items from process to sessions. So um, I'll start with the process stuff. I think it would be very useful if there was a template that was created that if you have an idea, you have to fill it out and you have to submit it in advance of the GPC and then it gets included in the agenda um, in that, you know, the template would say, you know, what's the topic, what are the imagined outcomes, um, who would be invited, and then everybody has that in advance of the GPC, and it's a nice starting point as we go into agenda planning, um, and, and I think uh, that it would, be very, it would make it very useful to make decisions quickly if, if we do need to have a GPC, and then where does it fit, or no, this is an item that could go direct to council, I also think that would be very useful, uh, as Councillor Gesselbrock indicated, that when staff bring forward an idea that it's included on that list, we can inquire about it, and it might be something that we just say, no, we don't need to have a GPC discussion, that can go directly to Council in a report. Because um, my understanding of the GPC was it, it was for items that really f we felt like there would be a lot of discussion. If an idea gets to Council and turns out, hey, there is a lot of discussion, we can always just refer it back to a GPC. So um, I, I, I'm sometimes worried that the GPC has gotten a little bit too big and we bring too much stuff here where we could probably, a lot of it could just go direct to council. Um, but I do think a template to get everybody on the same page to have that idea in their agenda package beforehand would be really useful. Um, and it also forces whoever's bringing the idea to flush it out a little bit in their own mind um, uh, because they're going to have to make that pitch and it can't just be left... Uh, left and then we move on. Um, I do think staff should bring their ideas forward to the G GPC agenda planning session and they should be, uh, ultimately this is a committee of council, so we should be making that decision where it fits in. Um, I would say that if uh, one thing is if, it, if there is a, personally, I would like there to be less presentation 
if it's only if it's just regurgitating what's in the staff report, I'd rather just one or the other, um, a presentation or or the staff report. If they they can combine together if it's you know doing something a little bit differently, but I don't need it in both places. Um, but that's me personally. In terms of topics, uh, neighborhood associations, I think maybe tying into what you're talking about there, uh, I think that capital planning process, um, definitely in relation to strategic priorities, would be a very uh, a conversation I'd be very interested in. Um, and then finally, the crosswalk, pedestrian, infrastructure, transit. Um, I would happily have that conversation. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next I have is Councillor Armstrong. I just want to concur with everything Councillor Brown said. Okay, thank you for that. Ms. Gurry. Thank you, um, Chair. So just um, for clarification, I think, yes, Councillor Armstrong and Councillor Brown are kind of saying the same thing. And I'm just wondering if this, if this template is on the right track, Councillor Brown, or is there changes that you could see that would improve it? I think it more or less works, obviously, just with the, the, the meeting date, because that would be up to council to adopt um, uh, and slide it in somewhere if they, if they choose that it's a worthy topic. If I could add, um, so going forward, because um, we want to wrap this up fairly quickly, um, would you be, like we've all, everyone here has brought some ideas to the table, some of those are already on this list. Um, do you want to hear from us over the next week prior to our next GPC about, as Councillor Armstrong suggested, filling in that little format and just sending them off to you? Yes, uh, what I could do, Chair, is I could send you that template in a fillable out format, a Word document, and ask you to put in your input on the priorities that you have and bring it back to the next meeting if, if you're all in agreement to that process right now, then I could do that. A little bit of homework for everyone. Okay, excellent. Does anybody else have anything to ask? Councilor Brown, you're still on. You're yeah. Good? yeah. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not, I want to make sure that we're clear. When I was talking about a template, I was talking about brand new ideas that aren't on the list. So you want to bring an item forward, mm -hmm. you have to fill out it, just like our notice of motion policy. I'm just, so now we're doing an extra exercise outside of this about how we prioritize the existing list? Ms. Gurian, look at all the people. Um, thank you, Chair. So I think a, a little bit of both. So I think the items on this list have mostly been brought forward by a member of the GPC committee. So one of you has brought the items on page 17 of your agenda forward previously. So then you were asked to kind of prioritize which ones um, you would like to see dealt with sooner rather than later on that list. And I think Councillor Armstrong's idea um, was to fill out um, that template for the, your priorities for the next meeting um, and then make sure you're on the same page that you have the same desired outcomes or, or that, um, that you had it right. Because I, I had first suggested that staff would do the best to fill out what we thought your desired outcomes were and she suggested you all do it. So there's that part and then I did understand what you were saying for future items, um, Councillor Brown, so I got that part. So it's kind of both. Mm -hmm. okay. That's the way I see it too. Councillor Armstrong, you're back on my list. Um, sorry, I must have forgot to lower my hand. Okay. Oh, I got it lowered. All right, you're no longer on my list. Mr. Rudolph. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think this will take two or three GPCs to get this right. So we'll interpret what we think we heard today. We'll bring it back to you next time. It won't be perfect, but it's moving in the right direction. So I think today was 45 minutes. Maybe the next meeting will be 35 minutes, and then we'll get it to a point where we're as clear as possible. But uh, there's, yeah, we'll summarize this and try to package it in a way that seems to work. Uh, and uh, But there's probably going to be some things that we we'll need more discussion at the next meeting, which is the 22nd, I think. So uh, this is all helpful. And as long as we get to a place where we're on the same page in terms of understanding what the expectations are and how we're managing the process, mm -hmm. that's the goal. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to move on our agenda. Um, number 5B, which is governance and management excellence. 
the 2021 Association of Vancouver Island Coastal Communities Resolutions. Uh, Ms. Gurry, this is yours as well. Thank you, Chair. So we asked Council to um, put forward any resolutions that you um, would like to bring forward to the Association of Vancouver Island and Coastal Communities Resolutions. We have received um, some resolutions that we're going to put on the screen. The deadline for these resolutions to be submitted is Friday, February the 26th, 2021, and they require um, that Council approve these resolutions. So they will be coming forward to the February 22nd Council meeting for your final approval. So today is to go through the resolutions that we have received and um, to adjust them to meet the um, procedure guidelines that um, were attached to the resolution instructions. So resolutions need to have two whereas clauses. The whereas clauses should only have um, one sentence in each clause. So a few of the resolutions we received um, have more than two whereases, so it's looking at omitting or combining the whereases to match what the guidelines state and get the GPC's approval to forward them to council for approval for forwarding to AVICC. So we're going to put, as soon as we can, the um, resolutions up on the screen. In your agenda, they were actually included on the addendum because we gave council some time to submit them. And we have some of the resolutions there, or all of the resolutions there. So, and there they are on the screen. So we didn't include the background information on this. That will be included to council. Um, so these are just the resolutions for wording purposes. So it's to ensure the wording is correct and then have you forward it on to council. So I'm just going to find them here on my screen. So the first one is right to repair. Um, Council Gesselbrock brought this forward. And there um, is two whereas clauses. Um, and so this one is good to go. So if the GPC committee is OK with forwarding this one to the council meeting on February 22nd, then we can move forward. Uh, thank you. Um, we're going to be doing these one at a time. Do, you, do we need to vote on them now, or is it just a question of vote uh, for them on to council? Um, you can do a vote at the end to move them forward to council. So this one is um, is correct formatting. So if there's any discussion, you can have that now on this one, and we can move forward to the second one. Councillor Gesselbrock, did you wish to introduce this, or you're you're good? Yeah, if we're going doing it all together, I was going to just speak to it one by one if that's the route. But it sounds like we're going to just go through it all at once. So I'll speak to these after we've gone through the the three ones that I put forward. Okay, that's fine. Um, then number two. So chair, for number two, um, there are three whereas clauses. So we do have to narrow it down to two whereas clauses. So just looking for some guidance from Council Gesselbrock or the rest of Council um, and for Council's discussion for the GPC committee's discussion about any of these resolutions one at a time as we go through them. So this is, this is for you to workshop your ideas. Council Gesselbrock, you're the one with the next or whereas. Sure. Um, so We've had a lot of, all three of these um, resolutions have come out of a inter-municipal working group um, focused on zero waste and circular economy. And so there's representatives across BC uh, from local government and then um, also professionals working in the field. And so these were identified as sort of these three, mo these three resolutions as uh, key priorities uh, for provincial action, um, sort of in addressing next steps for developing circular economy and zero waste. Um, there was a lot of discussion uh, in the working groups um, on the number of whereas clauses and the recommendation sort of in the AVICC uh, booklet is to have uh, two. I did do some research into uh, whether three is okay, um, and a lot of the resolutions that do go through to AVICC, they do publish uh, ones with three, um, and uh, I did ask about that, and so uh, these, a lot of thought have been put into the whereas clauses, and 
and, and a lot of effort to combine them into two and it, it wasn't possible. And so the decision of that working group was to, to stick with the three and, um, and uh, the feedback that I received in inquiries to AVICC folks was that it is okay. So I don't know um, the direction that staff have been given on the reduction down to two whereas clauses and sort of the uh, degree of um, allowance requested, but my preference would be to just stick with uh, the resolutions as is. Ms. Curry. Um, thank you, Chair. Through you to Council Gesselbrock. It, it was in the request for submissions that was attached, um, and it's, a, it's in your agenda as well, and it says um, resolutions must be properly titled, resolution must employ clear, simple language, must identify the problem, reason, and solution, must have two or fewer recital whereas clauses, and resolution must have a short, clear, standalone enactment therefore clause. So it's just basically following the instructions that we were provided. We didn't follow up um, to see if more than two were okay. We were just um, following mm -hmm. the guidelines that um, we received. Um, one possible solution, though Council Gesserbrock went on to say a lot of work and thought was put into this, so um, if, if Council's willing to move forward with the three as they are, um, my only suggestion would be the third whereas clause um, be put into the background. Um, that was my only suggestion, trying to narrow down to two, so. I have next, uh, Councillor Brown, I'm just going to Fair away, sir. Thanks, uh, Chair. Um, I'm just I'm fine with the three whereas clauses. I I, I know it, the the UBCM and, and through AVSCC has put out the, you know, how you can get a gold star resolution by keeping them short. It's just a target. Um, uh, year after year, um, resolutions are submitted. I think it's a good target because some of them are far too lengthy. Uh, but for me, more importantly, it's uh, the content, and uh, I, I'll happily support this one. Councillor Hemmons. Oops, sorry, I just kicked you off. That's okay. Right. Thanks, Chair. I was going to say the same thing, particularly if these were a collaboration um, of municipalities across the province, and this motion or these motions presumably will be going to other tables like AVICC. I think keeping the integrity of them is important. So we might not get a gold star, but or a gold star, but uh, I think the content is there and needs to remain so. Thank you. And. Ms. Curry, in your um, experience in these sort of things, has AVICC ever tossed resolution because they didn't fit the format? We have heard back from them when we're missing and or it's not in the right format. So if we do this time, we would follow up um, with council. But we only have till the 22nd, I'm guessing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so our, our goal today is to get them as right as can be for the 22nd to then pass on to meet the deadline. So um, yes, we have heard back in years past when resolutions don't meet the criteria set. Um, I, um, I can't remember a specific example, I just know it's mostly to do with the background, the inappropriate background information has been attached. Thank you. Your Worship. Uh, for what it's worth, I uh, am very supportive of all the resolutions that have been put forward, and I would hate to see us be booted out on a technical matter, which, with great respect, is kind of inconsequential in terms of getting to the actual resolution itself. So I'm just going to strongly suggest we follow the rules strictly and, and let's get on with it rather than risk any of these not actually making it into the book at least, whether or not they get debated, as we all know, is another problem. But uh, I'd like to see these advanced, and I don't want to hobble or destroy that possibility just because we want to leave a third recital in there. Uh, I, I definitely appreciate the, the mayor's concerns. Like this uh, discussion, the exact discussion that we're having on whether to have two or three whereas clauses and whether AVICC will accept it and the reasons behind that was had ad nauseum with the, the group that I worked with and um, it, you know, we, we did reach out to people on the resolution committee that have been there on the past, ex-vice presidences, consulted with UBCM resolutions folks, you know, my experience on the UBCM and it was decided that 
um, you know, to, to put forward the three and that it was uh, guidelines and th th they're trying to avoid, you know, six whereas clauses that are, you know, eight, you know, a, a paragraph each, whereas these are, are very succinct. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, it would be useful to see what the current resolutions committee at AVICC does say about it. Um, so it, I think send it as is, and if we do get feedback, then we'll know for sure that the advice that we've been given uh, has been off and, and, and not, but I, I would be surprised if they, they said anything uh, re regarding these. Um, so I, I would like to try, and if it doesn't, I mean, um, these are going through other channels as well, so thanks. Thank you. So in for a penny, in for a pound. Okay. Um, then uh, number three. Similar. So the, yes, number three is Council Gessebrock as well, and um, similar. So um, so I'll leave it to Council Gesselbrock. Yeah, the same thing. Uh, I could send the one where I did uh, have two whereas clauses, and it just in terms of communicating the ideas, just it, it was decided on by quite a few people to, to stick with the three, so um, yeah, thanks. Okay. How about number four? Both yep. Way to go, Cheryl. So um, number four we did, um, Councillor Armstrong, if, are, if you're still around, um, we did reach out to the bylaw department for some background information, and we do have um, some additions. I don't think Ms. Snellgrove had time to incorporate that into some whereas is. So what we could do is um, send it to you and ensure you're okay with it that way. But um, that gist of it right there, that would be the therefore, be it resolved clause. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I was hoping for it, that you would put it into the right format that you saw. I mean, I can do that, but I think they get ridiculous with all their whereas. And people just lose the mind. I know we have to, but people just lose it when you see them all. So, yes, um, we do have a couple whereas's for you. We just didn't have time to put it in the document this morning because we just heard back from bylaw um, earlier today. So we will get that and make sure you're okay with it. And if um, council here is okay with that being the therefore be it resolved clause that's listed, then we'll proceed. Thank you. And uh, next is Councillor Thorpe's. To number five. Go ahead, sir. Oops. Thank you, Chair. Um, and my apologies, Ms. Gurry. I had two whereases and I felt compelled to add a third. <laughs> but <laughs> brevity is the soul of wit, advice I don't always follow. Uh, I'm quite happy to uh, remove the third one. I think it can fit into the background, or which I did take a fair amount of time over. So I'm, I'm fine with that, and uh, I'm happy to speak to this if it goes forward to Council. Thanks. All right, so we're losing the third whereas, and you're going to drop it into the background. Now, is it the desire of council today to debate these, or do we just want to send it on to council and debate it at that time? I think some discussion today, Chair, might be useful just because once it gets to council on the 22nd, there's not much time to make changes at that point. So if you want to have some talk, some discussion about it, Today is kind of that day, so that at the 22nd you can rubber stamp it, okay. I dare to say. And do you require motions here, or are we, motions would obviously come from a council meeting? Uh, the motion does need to come from council, but we would like you to forward these to the um, council meeting. So just basically direction that as, as you've discussed and as they're stated now today, once we got them right, which basically there wasn't much work to do, that you forward to council for their approval. So a motion at the end um, after discussion for each one, um, whichever you prefer. And uh, would these be shown up at the council table as, a, as in the consent agenda? Guy, you talk. Yes, I believe they would be under the um, consent agenda with the amended wording attached so that you're getting the full picture of the changes. 
Thank you. Okay, which means if we want to debate them at council, we'll have to pull them. That's okay. Okay, so let us start with uh, number one. Councillor Gessebrack. Uh, wait a sec. I'm sorry. I have Councillor Turley. You're at the top of my list here. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a couple of questions on number one. Um, the uh, terminology, uh, manufacturers are deliberately designing products to be disposable, and I'm wondering if um, what that specifically type of product it refers to, because I'm having trouble, uh, when, particularly when it comes to technology, you know, Commodore 64 versus a smartphone. Um, I don't think the companies would deliberately, uh, that was more based on consumer demand and new technology, and I'd hate this to be uh, counter to technology improving uh, and becoming you know, what is becoming year after year after year, uh, because obviously it's difficult to carry a Commodore 64 around with you. When you're, <laughs> I know that's an exaggeration, but um, so I wouldn't mind uh, clarification on that. And then the, one, the other one that I, I'm not understanding is uh, businesses are deterred from repairing their belongings by companies that claim ownership of the intellectual property of their products. And again, um, is that, I, I know sometimes there's been an issue with one of the auto manufacturers where they um, uh, don't necessarily like non-dealer repair shops, um, and I'm not gonna name the company, uh, doing the repair work. Uh, in other words, it's difficult to get parts. Uh, I don't know if that's what you're referring to or, or is there something else that I'm just not getting? Um, if you want to, I'm just going to go through the list just so we can get back up to you. Uh, Your Worship. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I appreciate the comments of, of Councillor Turley, but uh, for me, all of these resolutions are basically the same thing and a terrible analogy. It's a bit like a kid saying, I'm hungry. What you're going to feed the child, when you're going to feed the child, how you're going to feed the child is a matter for some discussion some other day. All of these basically speak to requests from the general public that are going to get debated by, hopefully, if we're lucky, municipal politicians. Uh, this is one of those areas where I'm happy for us to, quote unquote, step into, as the UBCM and AVICC historically do, into the realms of provincial jurisdiction. And that's all we're really asking for here is saying, look, most of us are tired of buying crap and we're tired of taking it to uh, depots or throwing it into the garbage can or whatever because it can't be repaired, it's not designed to be repaired or it's too expensive to be repaired. To wit, the latest TV I just, we had to buy and drop off an old one. I mean, it's preposterous. So uh, uh, I appreciate the desire to sort of get into deep debate, but it just seems to me if this generally expresses an idea that we can support, let's get it up the chain as quick as we can. Thank you, Worship. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you, Chair. I may have missed the process here. Would you like us to respond to each one individually or because I'm, I'm happy with four of them going to Council and I'd like to argue against one of them going to Council? How would you like me to do that? Um, we could do them one at a time until we get to your fifth. Okay. Um, so do we just go by vote or does anybody else wish to? Um, I'm going to ask Councillor Armstrong I think we'll do them one at a time. Um, I agree with them all, so I'll be voting yes for all, just so you know. Okay, thank you. Councillor Martman, and then I think, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was looking to vote for all of, them, all of them at one time, partly because this has to go to AVICC, which is then whether they recommend that it to go further to UBCM. I think the work that it's gone into these, I can't, I couldn't see anything. I mean, if it was going to debate whether we were doing pro-choice or not, I might have a different answer. But I think for all of these motions or, or going forward, I think they're well written. I don't want to sit here and nitpick because they have to, we may get there and AVICC may say we don't like any of them. So, or they might like them all. I don't see us debating them right now. Thank you. The only thing I would say to that, Councilor Martman, is that if we if we send these off the ABC is because this council has passed them approved as a resident, has approved it. So if council, council doesn't isn't approving of all of them, then we wouldn't ordinarily right. send them all. So I guess that's where we're, we're going to do them one at a time. Um, I do have a problem with one of them as well. Okay. So um, I just didn't want to necessarily put our name on it. 
Okay, I won't move the motion then. Thank you. <laughs> so, I'm looking for a motion to approve number one. Unless Councillor Gusbrock, you wanted to answer to Councillor Turley's question regarding disposable items. Quickly uh, respond. Uh, I think I um, uh, appreciate you raising that. Uh, this is legislation that's been put forward sort of all over the U.S. It's in the works in Ontario and Quebec and, um, and also in uh, Europe and sort of the whereas clauses reflect uh, research and um, understanding of, of sort of trends in how products uh, and were, were being manufactured and, and business strategies going forward that uh, could potentially be counter to having a bit more of a sustainable material use and so um, I think it speaks to these points in the um, background resolution um, and uh, more information could be found on it, but uh, I think they're pretty solid. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else on number one? So, so I'm probably not going to go by motion. We're just going to say everybody in support of number one, put your hand up. <coughs> Sounds good? Okay. Go through each one, yeah. Everybody in support of number one, put your hand up. Councillor Armstrong, you already said you're in support of them. And, but, yeah, yeah, Chair, please, um, a, a motion. So oh, as you did it the first time, yes. <laughs> it can't go under consent items if it's not a motion. So. Right, okay. Moved by Councillor Hemmons, second by Councillor Gusselbrock, number one. All those in favor? <laughs> Any opposed? Councillor Turley is opposed. I look forward to your debate at the AVICC. <laughs> 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 Number uh, two, motion by Councillor, uh, by um, His Worship Mayor Krog, seconded by Councillor Hemmons. All those in favor, raise your hands. Any opposed? Hearing none, number two is off to our consent agenda. Number three, BC Circular Economy, motion by His Worship, seconded by Councillor Hemmons. All those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, that's carried as well. Number four, Restorative justice as suggested by staff. How do you want to do that one? Um, yes, thank you, Chair. So this one came from Councillor Armstrong and that um, uh, it would be the therefore be it resolved that a municipality be given the option of allowing restorative justice as a means to resolve bylaw infractions. The whereas is would basically um, be based on some of her background would be put into a whereas clause and be brought to um, the consent items. Okay, works for me. Number four, I'm gonna Councillor Martman, seconded by Councillor Hemmons. All those in favor, raise your hands. Any opposed? Somebody wish to talk? No? You, you, Mr. Chair, just oh. uh, on this, uh, you, would you want a staff report on this before the council meeting? to explain what this means, how it affects what we do now, or anything like that. Uh, I think it would help the cause if it goes to the AVIC with a package of information that explains it, uh, so you're aware of that. So we could try to cobble that together for the next meeting. I don't know, maybe I'm speaking out of school, but this is one that would we could probably put an information kit together to explain a little bit behind the scenes on this, otherwise you're getting uh, uh, not a complete set of information in front of you. Not saying that it's wrong, I'm just saying that uh, there's, there's not been a lot of due diligence explained to you why this is you know, additional information. So I think that would be uh, something we could provide to you if, if you're interested. I think that would be great and, and help certainly help out in, in when it goes forward from there. Thank you. Hope you have enough time. <laughs> that would be helpful in selling the uh, concept to uh, government and so you're fully aware of the situation here as well. Thank you. Councillor Gusbrock, your name's on my list. Uh, no, I thought we were, uh, yeah, no, I'm good. Okay, that brings us up to number five. Um, so it looks like this one is up for debate. Uh, this is Councillor Thorpe. Motion by yourself, sir? Motion, Motion seconded by Councillor uh, Maz Worship. Mayor Krogh, I think we have some debate. Councillor Hemmons. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I won't be supporting this one, and there's a couple of reasons. 
One is, in my experience as a local elected official, um, four years, let me back up. Our work on the health and housing plan, we're now entering into almost two years of work on that file with still a lot of work to go. So when I'm thinking about those big portfolios, um, three years is not enough time to see the creation of a plan, the implementation of it, and then to support um, the community's, I guess, acceptance of that integration. Or It just seems too short of a timeline for some of the big pieces of work we're doing. And the second piece um, is that, um, it is, it is a big commitment to run for office, um, and I think we're seeing more and more folks run for office who are not typical in that they're not retired. And so um, asking someone to take um, a number of years out of their career to enter into this position, um, I think a longer term is actually more amenable. And I can speak from a personal experience, um, I think, Leaving a career for a four-year term is a little bit easier than leaving a career for a three-year term um, just because of the longevity and the ability to accomplish the plans that you set out to do. Thank you. Thank you. I have Councillor Gessebach next. Thank you. Um, now this was an interesting one, and i got to say, sometimes I wish for a three-year term. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I feel that four is not enough. Um, and so it just really made me reflect on it, and uh, it's interesting that this has been a debate uh, that's been had by the province uh, numerous times, and it, we did switch from a three to a four-year term for some reasons, and, um, and there's now apparently um, the reasoning for moving uh, from the whereas clause to a, to a three to the four has, has been shown to be invalid, so I'd be curious, like, uh, on that, and, and, and I think, you know, after having two uh, four-year terms, it would be interesting for local government to reflect on, uh, on this question. Um, and I, I think, you know, I, I do agree with Councillor Hemmins is that three years is, it's very tough to accomplish a lot of change, and, and, and um, maybe that's a good or bad thing, and maybe it's good to have a sort of a, a three-year check-in from the community on whether you think your council uh, is reflecting your needs and if they're really not to be able to get them out before they do four years of damage and yeah it's uh, six and one half a dozen the other but I'd be interested in discussing this more so I, I am supportive of this um, to, to, to hear what the experience of other municipalities are and to, to have a little referendum on this change that we made uh, eight years ago thank you Thank you. Next is Councillor Martman. Thank you. I agree with Councillor Hemmins. My, my personal opinion is I, I think the four years works better. I think it's both from a council perspective of trying to accomplish the work and get things done. I also think of it from a staffing um, perspective because it gives them the more fluid time to, to work through four years rather than having a new council every three years and having to go through that orientation and starting from the beginning if you have new councillors. However, having said that, Though I wouldn't support the change to three years, I do support this going forward. And the reason I support it going forward is so that the debate can happen at AVICC or the UBCM and hearing what the majority have to say. So I do support the motion going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, I thought this was an interesting one to think about. It caused me <laughs> to really sit and think about uh, my thoughts on this. Um, I do note that uh, Nanaimo put forward a similar resolution in 2017 that was uh, that was not um, uh, permitted for debate. Um, uh, very similar, very similar wording, slightly different, but for the most part similar. Uh, I won't be supporting this. Um, I think. Two, takes a little more than two terms to see if the experiment is playing out. Um, and, and, but more importantly, I actually am support, I think I, I used to be, I wasn't supportive of the change initially, but more and more I have become supportive of the four-year term, uh, simply for the reason that I think the shorter period of time, I think, works in some sense uh, for, for some particular bodies uh, when it's balanced by a, a longer-term plan. And, and 
uh, you know, the United States government structure comes to mind uh, and how they do that. And I think there's, if you go too short, there's, it brings risk the, the, the lack of strategic foresight and uh, becoming very reactive in your decision making and always having to respond to uh, very quick things that uh, become very passionate, things become very passionate in the community, but they might not be decisions made in the, the long term, best for the long term sense of the community. So um, I won't be supporting this. Uh, you know, if it goes forward, I, I'm, I'm happy to see that debate as well, but um, I think there's some logic in the four year term and I, I have some fears as they start to get shorter and shorter based on the, uh, the whereas clauses presented. Uh, you know, I think if you follow to the logical extension, why wouldn't we just go down to one or two years again? If, if check in with the community is through elections, um, uh, I think there's lots of ways to check in through the community. And I also think probably what is lacking in our province is not so much the length of the term, but uh, provincial oversight when things are going poorly um, I think the province needs to step up and, and hold local councils or local governments to a higher standard and their ability to pass a budget by a certain date. That seems to be the only time they'll ever step in is when a budget can't be passed. Um, so I think there's some work to be done there. I just don't think this is the, the way to do it. Your Worship. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. It was a caucus decision to support this legislation when it first came through. And my position hasn't changed. I've always believed that uh, unless there was some overriding provincial interest, municipalities should be able to set their terms themselves. If Sabalis wants to have a two-year term, which makes sense for a small community in a big city like Vancouver, where it's a full-time job with full-time pay and benefits, then they should have their four years or five years if they want. Uh, so I, I'm very supportive of three years. I think that was a good length of time. I think it's appropriate. Uh, and so I support it for that reason. And secondarily, uh, as has been articulated by councils Gesselbrock and Martman, just to get it on the floor again, because I think it's important that we have this debate. Thank you. Councillor Thorpe. Well, thank you, Chair. I guess I should have spoken first to this, but uh, I'll speak now. Um, yeah, it's a conversation I would like to see uh, uh, brought forward again. Um, and, and no disrespect, but I'm sure most, most incumbents on most councils would uh, happily have longer terms and not have to go back to the electorate as often. And, uh, and I can understand that, but I think in terms of accountability, uh, in terms of democratic input, we need to strike a balance of uh, what, is, what is too often uh, and, and what is not often enough. And the four-year term has been an experiment which has now been in place for two terms. And uh, certainly I'm seeing around the province a lot of uh, examples where uh, it's not working out and the electorate has no chance to step in and make changes. And I agree with Councillor Brown's comment that, uh, yes, maybe there's other uh, ways that that could be dealt with uh, by an integrity commissioner, but that's been, that's been touted before and that has not happened. To me, uh, I think there's always going to be an argument from incumbents that, oh, we haven't had enough time to finish our plans or to finish our projects. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I don't accept that. If the electorate feels that people are doing a good job, they get re-elected and the planning continues and the projects continue. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, the electorate feels that the project or the planning is not what they want, then they have a chance to say so. So I think it's about accountability. I think a, a three-year term is a good compromise uh, between two, which I agree is, is probably too short, and four, which in my opinion is just too long. And, and I have to say that anybody that I have spoken to, uh, whether or not they think this council is doing a good job, they tend to agree with the, the arguments that I've put forward. So uh, I covered it in the backgrounder and I would appreciate having this discussion again at the uh, provincial level. So that's my pitch. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And um, I now have more. Uh, Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. I'm very much in favor of the three-year term. Having listened to the arguments when we were at the uh, UBCM, having spoken with people as, like such as Council, former Councillor Brennan, who did two, three, and four, all state three is the best possible term you can do. It's more effective. It allows you to do three terms in nine years versus three terms in 12 years, which a lot of people think about in those terms. 
you see, you see when you're in your first term to think, oh, yeah, four years, not that long. But then when you get into eight years and then 12 years, it does become longer. I also think three years will actually have more people wanting to come forward versus four, especially if this is a part-time job. And being a part-time job, you know, I'd much rather do something for three years and four years. I agree with what the mayor said. We're in Vancouver and those places where it is full-time, four or five, exactly. Especially when you get into some smaller communities, four years, they can really destroy a community. This is not only just about Nanaimo. This is about the entire province. So for me, I'm 100% I'm in support of the three-year term. I think it's far more effective. And as Councillor Thorpe said, if you're doing a good job, you'll get reelected. Thank you, Councillor Armstrong. Councillor Turley. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, too, support this going to the AVICC. Uh, you know, there was some discussion about from some councillors about younger councillors um, needing the four years. And I think on the reverse, we have to consider uh, councillors at my age. Um, four years is a lot can happen in four years, as I found out. Um, and so it, there, the potential when you've got a four-year term is that you could end up with a significant number of by-elections because they, you know, none of us are here for a long time, hopefully for a good time. But um, uh, so I, I think it needs to be flushed out, that there needs to be a compromise uh, between uh, four and three years or four and two is what it used to be years ago. Um, so I, I support it going forward for further discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Turley. Councillor Armstrong, uh, Hammonds, you were on there. You changed your mind? Okay. Um, I guess I get to be the last on this. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to support this um, as well. Um, I, I, I see that every province in Canada, except the Yukon territories, uh, Yukon and Northwest Territories have a four-year municipal elections. It seems to be relatively working fine for them. Um, in terms of the, the good governance, um, I think any council from the get-go could be practicing good governance. So I don't really think that's a question of, of length of term. Um, I do notice that there, uh, in, in Councillor Thorpe's um, background, he, he quotes the um, uh, Victoria uh, Times, the Times colonist. Um, and so I did a bit of research. Uh, that, that quote is actually referenced into the last by-election. Um, and and I, I think I'm of the opinion that the Times colonist isn't too keen on what's happening at City Hall right now. Uh, because in March 4th of 2014, uh, the editorial from the Victoria Times colonist titled Four-Year Votes Are Good Move, and where the BC government is proposing that municipal elections be held every four years instead of every three, while it will likely benefit larger municipalities more than smaller ones, it's generally a good move, providing it includes an effective means to get rid of bad apples, which I think is a good point. Um, and also, Council Thorpe mentioned the, uh, for potential candidates, considering running a three-year commitment is, is much less daunting than a four-year. Um, the research done by the, Vic, uh, Van, the Victoria Times colonist on January 9th, 2018, titled Four Years Terms Are No Barrier, um, they, they say put up, we see research uh, done by the local paper there, and I quote, municipal governments affect our daily, our lives every day. If, as it appears, longer terms have, no deterrent, uh, have not deterred candidates, we are all better for it. So um, I believe that the, the, this idea of, of moving to uh, three-year terms, at least by the, the Times colonists, is based on the fact that the, their political views of the current council as opposed to their views in the past. So uh, based on that, I think overall um, a four-year term is 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 gen it generally would be better it's used right across the province or I'm right across Canada and also I would be much more interested in in looking at things that help people maintain four years and if they choose to do it uh, over two terms that's literally one quarter of your working career so I'd like to see um, uh, possibly resolutions on, on benefit plans and possibly better remuneration for people who choose and have the ability to, uh, to take that much of their career, working career, uh, dedicated to the public. So with that, um, I've encouraged Mr. Rudolph to make some comments. No, <laughs> just, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I attend almost all of these UBCM meetings where this was debated and watched the discourse go back and forth and councils uh, kind of opinions here today reflect what you will predictably see at the ABICC and UBCM floors 
it's close uh, either way and there's the, all those comments will be shared again I think in, initially the resistance was primarily from the smaller municipalities who collectively all said they had a hard time getting people to make a four-year commitment and that was their biggest concern with it and uh, so a lot of vacancies a lot of acclamations took place and perhaps still do so that was one thing and the second piece is that if you have a high performing council like we have uh, it's a good experience if you have perhaps a less high performing council uh, it's a long time and so there's always rolling the dice with this the other argument that was presented that I recall was and it's it's part of it is the cost uh, there's a cost savings to economize and I forget what the cost that we're projecting it's over 200,000 I think I may be wrong but uh, there's a fair amount of cost attached to every election to do it correctly so uh, but you know I think council's kind of a mix of opinion here is what you'll probably see at the uh, at the floor and but you know there's some interesting add-ons that I've heard about maybe benefits and those types of things that's a that would be a real beneficial thing to come out of this if there was some improvements to the system because it is a big it is a big uh, loss of income and so forth for a lot of people so you know just having sat there and heard all the debates I, I, I can anticipate you'll hear that all again but then maybe there's some improvements that can be made so it's a it's an interesting conversation thank you um, so with that um, I will call the question all those in favor of the motion to include this raise your hand please I have Martman, Councillor Martman, Skesselbrock, Thorpe, Krog, and Turley, and I'm guessing Councillor Armstrong. Big hand up there. All those opposed? Of Councillor Brown, Bonner, and Hemmins. Thank you very much. We shall see every, all of five at our next council meeting. Thank you very much. Moving along, something not quite so much as fun. Reimagine an IMO. I'm, I'm kidding, of course. This is the best part. Yes. Okay. Let's have a let's have a five minute break, and we'll all be back from there. Thanks. Leonard Krogh here. I'm here with Karen Lindsay today. She's going to show me how to sign up for our app. Boy and Alert, the City of Nanaimo's emergency notification system. So we'll start by going into the App Store, Mayor Krogh. Done. Next, you're going to hit uh, search. And you're going to search for the app, which is Voyant Alert. So it's V-O-Y-E-N-T. Now you see it it's already up. selected it. Click there, hit get and then we're going to install. And why are we downloading this app? We're downloading that so that you can get this onto your phone system and what it will do is it will send you a push notification out. So if the city of Nanaimo issues an emergency alert, it will actually push the notification out onto your phone. Um, the really uh, nice part of this app is that it's it's anonymous, so it goes by postal code. So you're, we're not requesting you to put your name or personal information in, it just works off of the app through your phone system. There are also, um, if you have family members or friends that maybe don't have a smartphone or would like uh, another way, you can also sign up online or call our public works department and they have uh, phone and texting options available as well. So there's lots of options for people depending on what their needs are. Fabulous. So you can rest with some comfort knowing you can find out what's necessary and know that people who are important to you are notified. Absolutely. 
So now you have volume alert on your phone. And now just select open. So the next thing you're going to do is you're going to tap in the postal code that it's prompting you. All right. So, so you just click on there and start entering. And then find on a map. So here you'll see the welcome page for yes. the city of Nanaimo and yeah. you want to click subscribe to notifications, yes? Yes. Click that you agree to the terms, so click both to the yes for consent and then hit next. And it's yes. going to ask um, to either allow or not allow notifications and you want to always allow. Always allow. Always allow. And the reason that is if you don't allow, it won't push the notification out to you. So always allow. Always allow. And now you see here you've got a, a message to accept that you've signed out. That's the two-factor authentication and you're going to tap yes. And now you're in the system. Also, when you have a moment, we recommend that you pick your locations and sign up based on those locations. And then you'll get alerts from the City of Nanaimo. Karen, thank you. Everyone, sign up. Tiana? Hey. This sure is the coldest rink in town. <laughs> Whoa! Yeah, buddy! Nice save, James! <laughs> wow, your goalie is keeping you guys in the game. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, oh, oh man, that's hot. Sorry. That's the way I like it. Oh. oh. Go, 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 go. Scalds from hot drinks are a leading cause of hospitalization for children under five. Two minutes, stand in the front, unsportsmanlike conduct. Hot tea and coffee will cause serious burns to a child in less than a second. Got a kid? Use the lid. What we have here is the real ice technology that was installed at the Nanaimo Ice Centre. It uh, allows us to use cold water from traditionally hot water that we used to use for making ice. Basically, the water will come in through the bottom, go in through a vortex idea, uh, making the air bubbles microscopic in size, which makes a better, more dense sheet of ice. Differences that you'll see with the real ice is there's less snow developed, so uh, that's easier for cleaning, and also it's a denser, harder, clear ice. So the ice skaters will certainly enjoy that. And the city plans to uh, implement real ice at our other two arenas as well. Some of the other efficiencies we've implemented in this facility are LED lights in some areas, and we've also, in the last few years, installed a higher efficiency refrigeration system, which lowers our energy costs. Both Sambonis at our facility are now electrically operated, so there's no harmful emissions, and uh, they're very quiet as well. So what this means for the city is that we're able to use less energy and also reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions, which is more beneficial to the environment. We're here uh, at Bruce and Dundas. Um, somebody's stolen the street names that were here, so we're here to replace them. Our sign shop has just generated us two signs, so I'm gonna go through the process of uh, putting it together and reinstalling the street names. First thing, we gotta center the signs. We do everything on this truck. We've got all the equipment on here to build, install, remove, repair, um, whether it's street signs, street names, uh, posts, banners. Um, Christmas decorations and so forth. I'm going to uh, basically just put the sign in the brackets and we'll be doing both signs of course. So I've got a cross bracket that I'm going to put in. And then add the top sign which is this street we're on, Dundas. Sorry, do the same there. 
We put the street that we're coming up to on the bottom, so they all basically have the same. The cross street will be on the top. We've got to put some bolts in to secure them so nobody will steal the street name. We're ready to go. I'll just put this back and we'll go out and install this where the missing one is. Every year we do what we call a stop sign survey where we go around and check all the stops. We clean them, make sure they're in the right spots, in good condition, not bent. And we also clean the, the street names, make sure they're good. As we're doing that, if there's ones that we decide we want to replace, um, we do that at that time. This year we're looking at approximately about 120 sets. It's very expensive to do but we're continually weekly changing street names. Uh, welcome back, folks. We're going to get our meeting started again, and we are now on 5C, Reimagine Nanaimo, uh, the Reimagine Nanaimo Phase 1 Engagement Summary, and it's going to be introduced by Mr. Lindsay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, we're back here again this afternoon. Um, as um, as the, the committee is aware, uh, you are the steering committee for the reimagine. So, it is, as you've talked about earlier this afternoon, it is a standing item on your agenda, uh, and will be for the next few months as we work through this process. Um, before I turn it over to Ms. Bhopal Singh, who's going to go over uh, the report and the results of our phase one engagement, and uh, talk about some of the key themes and emerging priorities, uh, just a couple of things I want to mention. And one is, although. I have the opportunity to introduce this this afternoon. It really could have been anyone from our senior management team because um, unlike many of the projects that we come to you with, this is not being driven by one department. This is across all departments, across all divisions in the city, uh, working collaborative, collaboratively on this, and you'll see a little bit more about that. Uh, so it's exciting from that perspective, but, I, but I, some, they have to pick somebody, so I guess I got to be the one that, that introduced this morning, this afternoon. Um, I think, to be honest, uh, I don't know if Council felt this, Mr. Chairman, but certainly as staff, uh, in my opinion, we announced probably the most ambitious public engagement process in the history of the city. And of course, a global pandemic hits the same week. So I think many of us were kind of nervous and had to adjust as we move forward going through this process. But I would say, and you'll see this today, that we had significant uh, interest from the community. Um, I think it's partly the result of our kind of adjusting our process, but I do want to acknowledge and thank Council for their support. And I do think it's a lot of the support we got from Council, whether it was doing videos, uh, showing up at the open house sessions, uh, helping us uh, with recommendations for referrals, or just word of mouth and getting the word out there about reimagining. And I also really uh, appreciate that and want to pass on uh, staff's appreciation for that. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Ms. Paul Pulsey. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Council and Reimagine Steering Committee. Before we jump into the Phase 1 Engagement Summary, I'd like to pick up on some comments about the neighbourhood engagement and give you a quick update on that. So, as you're aware, we had said that we would come back to you with um, the results of engaging with neighbourhood associations on issues around governance and options for moving forward. And so we're timing that with the actual results and using the information that we're getting from the phase one engagement summary. So we have the results of the survey of the neighborhood associations and the way in which we did the reimagine uh, feedback is that we could get the community broken down by neighborhood and use that as part of looking at what are some of the key priorities for neighborhoods in terms of planning and then working with the neighborhood associations that exist in terms of governance options. So we're hoping to come back to you in March to a GPC, uh, depending on the agenda and your priorities around that. So just so you know, that's where that's at. And also to emphasize that that work will also take into consideration the work of the Community Engagement Task Force which their last uh, pilot engagement phase included uh, really good feedback from the neighborhood. So bringing all of that together. So that's where that's at. So for the next, I'm gonna aim for 10 to 15 minutes of presentation, but I would like to encourage you to jump in as the steering committee and ask questions. We have the GMs from all the departments here, so they'll help answer them as needed and also cover anything that I may have missed. So I'm going to keep this pretty high level. You've got a pretty thick attachment document. And uh, I'm going to have about 20 -ish slides to go through covering the highlights of the engagement. So again, before I start though, one of the things I want to emphasize is phase one is about, this part of it is about community engagement. So that's engagement with individual citizens 
and stakeholder groups. And that is quite distinct from our engagement with other levels of government, including our First Nations governments, as As you're aware, I think back in your last GPC on February 11th, you heard from Joan Brown, the CEO of Snanemo. Those of you who are involved in the POG know about our ongoing conversations there. And so to let you know that we see that as per respectful protocol, uh, quite distinct from community or public engagement, which does, of course, include our Indigenous community members as well as other diverse members. So just want to make sure that you're aware of that distinction. So without further ado, again, quick overview. You guys know what this is about, but for members of the public, this is integrated strategic planning for the city. Uh, first time we've undertaken quite this uh, broad and an ambitious engagement during a pandemic and also we ended up with an election and lots of other exciting things happening. So this is where we're at. So phase one engagement is really was really about driving community awareness and gathering ideas. And so you can see where we're at. I'm gonna see right here. And then we're right here moving into phase two. Phase two is going to be grounded very much in the results that you have before you in the report today. And uh, phase two, just because we've done phase one engagement doesn't mean that engagement doesn't still continue. And in fact, phase one engagement is really about keeping people um, aware of the project so that when we come back to ask them about options, which is really the critical pieces about decision making, that they want to be part of that and continue to stay with us. So key highlights, we had I'm gonna say a tremendous effort on the part of staff, council, community groups who helped support the engagement. Uh, we had 39 pop-ups, PRC stepped up with a lot of creative options to engage the community in a safe COVID way. And we did a phenomenal job, I think, uh, even if it weren't COVID, I challenge anybody to have done what the city staff and our other partners had done helping us do this. 110 workshops, with different uh, stakeholder groups and a probably the largest response, not probably the largest response we've ever achieved in terms of community feedback. So when you look at the uh, recommendations of the community engagement task force, there were six priorities. And one was looking at how could we engage our community in key decisions? Well, I think we have to start that right here by raising awareness, looking at different technologies of and ways and methods. Again, with innovation, we've adapted tried and true methods to COVID and I think shown ways of using what I would call social capital networking to broaden engagement. And then the third piece is the engagement task force also recommended a centralized way of getting feedback and that was the launch of Get Involved in IMO. So that was the platform with which we used online to put the major well, basically, it was the focus of our engagement. So I just wanted to kind of link that back to some of the pieces that Council will have received, I think, in early 2019, based on those recommendations. Another key piece that we did is a technique that both Parks, Recreation, Culture, and Engineering frequently use, which is a statistically valid survey. And I'm pausing because I tend to stop all the words statistical. And so the importance of statistically valid versus the online is that it gives us a scientific way of measuring the likely outcomes or responses of the whole community. So I think it was Councillor Martman who noted that we got a response rate of 426 surveys out of 2,000 mailed out, 2,000 mailed out during an election. So, and that that was uh, quite, that was a great outcome. And what we found is we didn't need to use an additional 300 um, which we had on hold with the consultant discovery research to ensure good distribution throughout the city. So what you'll see is that the statistically valid within about 1% matched our census distribution through neighborhoods. So really uh, very encouraging that we used techniques that really gave us broad city representation. So. This, these are some really key highlights. So what you'll see here is on the right, the statistically valid survey, on the left, the public questionnaire. And of significance is more than half of the respondents in this process in phase one have never participated in a city planning process. 
So again, as our steering committee, there was a lot of uh, encouragement and direction to reach a diverse group of people. And one of the key things was engaging with people who previously haven't taken the opportunity to engage with the city before. So that's a pretty key piece. So in terms of demographics, um, despite all efforts and some very strong efforts with the school district, the 15 to 24 age group was underrepresented. I will say though that we count that by going to schools, we had PACs, every PAC distributing the survey and information to every family. We had great support from school district 68. And then we also had VIU planning students spend a week blasting out the information through their channels, their social media. And so even if people weren't engaging in the online survey to the depth in that age group, they were certainly aware. I remember going shopping with my daughter at Woodgrove and somebody seeing Reimagine My Phone and saying, oh yeah, I've seen that. And actually she did say she should do the survey. But um, then there was strong participation in the 30 to 40, 44 year um, age group too. And then as is fairly typical, higher and stronger participation uh, of those 55 and over. But to counteract the online and statistics survey and beef up those in demographics with less participation, we really did rely on our work with uh, the school districts. And I would say, I would also include in that reaching out to the elementary schools. So this is a, perhaps, a, I think, I find a really, really interesting um, outcome here. So what you see here is the, demographic, the geographic distribution of both the public questionnaire, so that's online and mail-in, statistically valid, and the last bar is the third bar in each column shows the census population for the geographic area. And you can see that particularly for the statistically valid, it is really within 1% of the actual population distribution. So Discovery Research managed to do a great job and our citizens did a great job in responding in those areas. You can see slight over-representation or higher rates of participation in the Departure Bay area. Um, and then in the downtown and university district. And that may be a result of the work of the VIU students, the downtown and the neighborhood associations promoting that out, as well as our different workshops. So really, the other thing that was affirming is that statistically valid um, showed us that our online and other efforts were in line with that response. So really uh, quite affirming for staff in terms of their efforts and for the community, I hope shows that we've made a, a very good attempt to get equitable feedback. So as I mentioned about overcoming barriers to participation, um, and this is feedback that came through this uh, steering committee here in council, um, we eliminated the requirement to register for questionnaires. We had Deliciously Nanaimo review a more accessible questionnaire format. Uh, we also uh, had the access the advisory committee on accessibility and inclusiveness some of their members look over some of the work we were doing and provided some guidance and one of the things i will say and i want to mention now is the work of the environment committee the aca committee ECDEV, and others is another subcommittee of your steering committee in terms of us getting community feedback and guidance on our next steps and we continue to work with them and use their expertise that way um, targeted stakeholder meetings. We had promotions through loaves and fishes and food share, again, trying to get people who have economic and other bar barriers to be aware of and participate. And um, I've mentioned some of the other ones. And then also outreach to some of the off-reserve indigenous communities to again, identify their priorities and issues. Another piece is we had the food security working group that was endorsed by council in terms of their outcomes, and that feeds back into Reimagine in terms of, uh, again, helping those who have barriers to participation, and also the work of the Health and Housing Task Force that continued. We had something like 16 uh, design dialogues that were canceled in March, the week of COVID, that we then redid as validation labs, um, and again, use all of that information will be fed back into Reimagine Nanaimo. And that included things like Sanaimo First Nation conducting two workshops for us, both on and off reserve. So all of those pieces will feed in to the process. We also have age-friendly Nanaimo, which you'll recall from 
a way back, that input will also be fed into this process. So this is an example of one of the stakeholder meetings that we were able to do in person. Many of them were done by Zoom. PRC also did some uh, outside in the covered, in parks and other areas. Um, and so we had really good support from the Brain Injury Society, a multitude of sports groups. Um, and now what I'm going to get into here is a few key highlights. What do people love most about Nanaimo? Uh, constant theme, our nature, parks and open spaces, our waterfront. So these are all things that we may have heard through other processes. Um, and then lower down other pieces around affordable lifestyle and having a green and sustainable city. Concerns. This probably won't surprise Council. Homelessness came up as a strong theme and linked to that uh, social challenges such as public use and crime. Uh, one of the pieces around the homelessness is the variety of input from different perspectives about how that should be addressed and whether the concerns were more linked to crime and or how to address this in a socially equitable way. Affordable housing, again, was a high concern for people and then the lower in the top five there, uh, safe transportation routes for cyclists and pedestrians. Okay, I, quality of life. And me, I, I will just on that last slide there, um, I read your report here. Um, I see a fair amount of um, concerns about not enough arts and cultural spaces in our parks um, and large, large and small performance spaces that's not appearing in this part here. So what you have here is the results from the public questionnaire statistic, statistically valid survey. And some of the information you've got in the report reflects uh, smaller stakeholder groups, group meetings that was added in. So um, that's part of the trick is balancing uh, several thousand people responding to online and the statistically valid versus these smaller stakeholder groups with a, uh, like a sector, whether it's football or soccer or um, the environment. So I, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, it, it does. My, my, my second part of that question is, how will this information I'm seeing in front of me uh, af af affect or, or, or uh, significantly work on um, staff's report? Uh, like, how, how, are, how are we going to deal with this? I, sort of thing going forward? That is a great question. And it comes down to each department balancing all of those inputs. So, and again, I think one of the reasons why we did this statistically valid survey is it gets the breadth of the community's input across neighborhoods. And say, for example, if it was for Parks, Rec and Culture, you could then break down by neighborhood, by postal code, you know, what are the priorities for people who responded in Departure Bay versus the South End? Um, and you could do the same on the um, culture questions and then balance those against um, stakeholder group meetings that naturally if we're engaging with, say, I'm going to use a club that doesn't exist, but the Tiddlywinks Club, mm -hmm. they would be like, well, we need more space for Tiddlywinks. Um, and yet the broader community might say, well, actually our priority might be this. And so that balancing, um, I think it comes down to the statistically valid survey ultimately having some weight. That's why we did it. It's like doing ballot polls. And ultimately, you as the steering committee will say, you know what, this is council's priority. So we will give you the information of all three levels of engagement and what that looks like. And you ultimately get to make the decision about the options that go into the plans. So if, just to help me put my, wrap my head around this, homelessness appears, you know, three quarters of the population uh, of, your, of the survey uh, have, have an issue or have a concern about this. Mm -hmm. how, how is that going to show up when we look at all of our rezoning bylaws, you know, the OCP and that sort of thing? What, what would it look like going forward? So part of it is breaking down how people want us to address it. And that's one of the things that we do need to define in more depth. So there are some people, their priority around homelessness is around equity and mental health and things that perhaps are beyond the city's control. <laughs> others, it's around affordable housing or supportive housing. And others, it's more of a crime-focused um, 
commentary. So again, we would come back to you with, here are some options <coughs> for addressing these different pieces. And the Health and Housing Action Plan in the case of homelessness would, I believe, have a strong influence on Council's broader policies, because that would sit, you'd have the reimagine process sitting here at the strategic level, and then you'd have implementation pieces that are sitting and informing that. So I don't want to give you all the answers because phase two is going to show us how we do that, and you're going to be involved in helping us shape that and shape the scenarios that go back to the community. So I would feel I'm a bit remiss to um, frame it up too, in too structured a way. And Councillor Thorpe has a question. I think. Yeah, comment. thank you, uh, Chair, through you if I will. Thank you, Ms. Bhopal Singh, for all of your work. Uh, um, very interesting. Uh, but specific to this uh, um, slide that we see in front of us, first of all, personally, I'm only interested in results which are statistically uh, valid, so I appreciate that uh, concern. But looking at, at this reminds me how careful we have to be um, on our language and our terminology. And when I look at the top bar, homelessness, my question out of that is, what do, what, what do we mean by that? Do we mean people who can't afford a house because they're trying to enter the housing market and they, and they just can't afford it? Because we already have that on the bottom graph, uh, accommodating people of family types, incomes, and so on. When we're talking about a concern for homelessness, are we talking about the the challenge of uh, the street people and the criminal uh, activity that sometimes results from, uh, from that. But that relates to the second bar down, the social challenges such as uh, drug use and crime. So, uh, and then we have affordability of housing and daily needs. How is that separate from homelessness or not enough housing? So, I find it a little bit confusing, and I don't mean this as a criticism, yeah. but I think it, it just, to me, uh, points out that we really have to be careful of what words we use and what we're referring to specifically. And I don't know if you have a comment on that, but mm -hmm. if you do, great. Thanks. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Thorpe, uh, that's a very fair comment, and it is one that certainly was raised when we looked at the summary document versus the original questions that, um, some greater definition in what people intended by looking at improving the challenges of homelessness, for example, what did they mean by that? And so that is something that um, we do have to spend a bit more time on defining, and we do have the benefits of the health and housing task force work to support that in part. And uh, I think you're right about the statistically valid survey. That's the very reason why it was done, was to look at a temperature check across the whole city, um, not relying on perhaps a public or online questionnaire that might not be as representative. In this case, it, they're pretty close. You can see the results there. So it, it is a fair point, and it is something that we do have to come back to you in phase two with a bit more definition and explanation around. Thank you. Carry on. Okay. Okay, so here's quality of life. On the positive, we have majority of people over 70% in both the public and statistically valid, seeing their quality of life as either very good or good. And then contrasting that, we have um, has your quality of life improved or worsened over the last 10 years, and a significant chunk um, seeing that it has, while over 50% still staying either neutral or saying it's actually improved about a quarter. And again, interesting to note the differences between the statistically valid and the public um, input questionnaire, particularly on the uh, quality of life, the first one. Okay, so some key issues and visioning ideas that came through uh, was a thriving downtown, a supportive community for all, waterfront continued theme of people want to see that, improved and supported, and a green approach. So the, we had uh, online opportunities for people to give their vision of Nanaimo in different geographic locations, so that's the outcome of that. What would you change? And so this mirrors, again, the challenges that you saw in the previous slide, social challenges, housing costs and availability, downtown character, crime and safety, all of which you can see themes and linkages between. 
Okay, and I know I'm jumping here and moving very fast. So we also had a creative community contest draw. And one thing I'd like to remark on is that we had several prize winners. We had three who got $500. This is the creative community contest. And what's lovely about this, this was a random drawer, so it was no um, selection per se amongst the different artists, is that this, this young person looked at a lot of integration with this park. He can swim and play at the same time as you have a water park, petting zoo, and people can connect and parents and children can have fun at the same time. Um, another neat thing that I would like to share is that one of the prize winners who got one of the top $500 prizes for the doing the online survey donated their prize money to the food bank. And then another prize winner who got a uh, $100 bus pass donated that to Haven. So really nice to see that being done and done in a very humble way uh, by prize winners. So, okay, so this is where we're at. We are in the excitement of phase two. And I actually just have to point out for, for council and the, the reimagined steering committee who have had us reframe to the donut, we kind of have a couple donuts down here already. So uh, this is a really key piece. This is where your support and the support of the committees uh, that you've created are really important to us in terms of framing up and exploring different options. These options are not just for land use, but like where do we put? And in your report, you'll see attached summaries for demographics. We've now hit an estimated over 100,000 people in Nanaimo. Where do we account for an extra 30 to 40,000 people in the next 25 years? How, where do we put those people? So this is a huge piece of the real crux of why we're doing what we're doing. And not only is it looking at land use options, but what other policy options are we doing around other things related to homelessness, social equity, the environment, climate change, how do we interact with our surrounding jurisdictions like the RDN and regional growth. So this phase is really um, the most critical and important and community engagement continues as part of that. And so what we hope is those who the tremendous volume of people who participated here will then be enticed to continue on critical decisions that we come back to them for feedback on um, in, in phase two. And then we hope more who were aware. The other thing you should be aware of is we estimate through the work of the boosting through our communications and other uh, departments that we reached over 10,000 people in terms of being aware of the process. They might not have chosen to give feedback, but at this stage where they see a real importance, some of those people may step up and give us detailed feedback. So next steps, coming back to you. Another question, if I may. Um, it's specifically uh, regarding the population increase. Um, is that based on pre-COVID concepts of migration um, because we're, we're seeing a lot more people coming here who now um, don't work at, in an office anymore. Uh, and, and, the, and the ability for people to move here and still maintain jobs in other provinces, uh, we saw a gentleman here just at the last council meeting uh, who has moved here from Edmonton uh, and, and still works uh, for probably for the company who was working there as a game developer. Um, does that now skew these numbers or where are we getting these numbers from? Well, I recall actually, I think it was Councillor Armstrong asking what impact COVID would have on the demographic projections. And one of the things we said is we've got a low growth rate scenario and a high. So while the scenarios that our consultants did was based on um, anticipating that COVID would likely cause us to slow down, built into that modeling are the higher growth rates. And so it allows us to, if we go for that, um, and I do believe based on some of you who joined us in the malls, I was actually quite surprised at the number of people who'd moved to Nanaimo that I personally spoke to in the last, uh, something like three to four months prior to us engaging with them in November, December. So I've also heard, and this is anecdotal, that some doctors are seeing a baby boom. People who aren't necessarily from Nanaimo having babies, but 
um, but that's, and locals, local people having babies, but other people moving here pregnant, and so the demand for doctors. So we, I think we have built into the low and high growth scenarios the ability to accommodate for exactly what um, may be not perhaps an unintended consequence of COVID that actually keeps us on track with um, growth because we are an attractive place to be. And so the interesting thing about undertaking this and council still steering us through this, many other municipalities with big processes like this just said pause. We're not gonna do this, we're not gonna try this till after COVID. We have the advantage of having engaged our citizens during COVID where they have a chance to reflect on what they want and for us to analyze what we're seeing in trends in terms of office work, work from home, and those pieces and the impacts on our vacancy rates and to build that into this instead of being reactive two years down the line. Um, that's, I guess, my belief. And so I, I feel pretty comfortable that the way our consultants did it, giving us the high growth rate, that we can aim for that and still and keep pace with being flexible for what we're actually starting to see on the ground. I hope, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So a big next step for us is coming back to you with some proposed indicators for consideration. Uh, we have work to do particularly with the Environment Committee as well as some of the other committees on some potential indicators that we can use through the donut lens uh, to um, build our scenarios and how we look at them and how we then develop a framework of sustainability through that framework. Um, and then coming back to the community, ideally April, May, with responses to the scenarios that we come up with your input. And then phase three, which will be actually narrowing down. And what we foresee is having one to three scenarios. And then based on the feedback from council and the community, maybe having a hybrid final scenario. It might not be A, B, or C. It might be a blend of A and B, for example and coming back to you with the actual draft plan development in fall and winter of 2021. Uh, of course, our timing, we hope, isn't impacted by anything major, and we can continue the way we have adapted through COVID. Um, and then the other next step is, as some of you are aware, we have some in-stream applications reimagined that we have to build into the phase two scenario development and, and evaluation. And then we usually have two intakes a year for OCP amendments, specifically in May and November. And we will be coming back to you with asking you to consider putting a moratorium on application inputs while we consider the broader scenario about where we're going. So that will be coming back to you for consideration. Okay. And then without further ado, I get to stand up here and because of COVID, I can't have a whole team of people standing behind me. But everything that you've seen in the report and the attachments is a tremendous effort. And this is a fraction of the staff, by the way. We're trying to keep it fairly safe. A fraction of the staff who are responsible for why we have had such great response, great individual stakeholder input, and they will be key to the scenarios and the drafting. So we have Parks, Rec, and Culture, who did a phenomenal job of getting physically out there in safe ways. People were out in our parks during COVID. They were using them tremendously. And so the sidewalk chalk, the engagement through um, some of the youth leaders, the presence at the beaches, all of that made a difference. And uh, then we had transportation doing work. Um, so special kudos to everybody you see on this and more and more and more and more, like I can't emphasize enough. Um, I'd also like to thank the senior leadership because they themselves were showing up and alongside yourselves, and that's a thank you to you, uh, we had feedback from people who were so impressed that our council members were so engaged in this process. And I had somebody, I think it was at Woodgrove say, wow, you, the city is really taking this seriously. And council and senior leadership are turning up you were in videos, you were present, you were wearing t-shirts. And so a lot of that is, <laughs> some of you, I didn't remind to wear t-shirts today, but um, 
that branding, you also guided the branding of Reimagine. Remember, we had a, 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 an alternative brand that didn't quite work. Well, Reimagine is so popular that people really like it. You, you guys have steered, there was an idea, I think, from Councillor Brown around the rainbow and the masks, and all of those things have really helped drive awareness of the process, pride in the city, and a real diversity of people wanting to be involved. And then I would be remiss in not thanking our consultants, and I'd like to congratulate Kate Evans, who you've seen on the screen before. She had a baby boy. Uh, I don't know what the name is, but I think we should maybe lobby for a reimagined type name, but that was last week. Um, and thank Kate and both Jana for pulling together probably one of the most complex engagement documents, satisfying the needs of all the departments and all the feedback they got in the report that you have. It was no small task, and I'm sure that they worked very hard to meet all of our integrated needs. So, um, and then the environment, all the different committees also want to acknowledge and thank them, the ones that you created and that you lead. Um, so I think without further ado, I think that is the last I have. And then I have a slide here to ask you if what you've received from us reflects what you've been hearing out in the community. Were there any surprises or reflections that came up? Other thoughts? Um, Thank, you. Thank you very much for that. I think uh, Councillor Hammonds would like to try some of that. Thank you. <laughs> I had my name on the list before the slide came up. Um, but no, no surprises. I think it aligned very much with what I'd been hearing in the community. Um, a, a couple points I do want to touch on. Um, having such um, participation from folks who have never engaged with the city before, that is a real win for me. Um, so I, I think that's something that we should be celebrating because there are people who take our surveys all the time, and that's great, we want that, but we also want input from those who maybe don't, have never engaged, and so I was really pleased with that. Um, I was really pleased to be invited into classrooms with some of the planners, and that was just the process is that I engage and then I never see myself. I think what you've done, and it's a 128 page document, but you've done a really good job of capturing everyone's voices. So my question is, is how do we then turn that? So I participated and I can see myself in that little document. How is that going to roll into phase two and will I still see myself there? Or if you didn't, if, if we didn't choose a scenario that I was um, passionate about, why wasn't it included? Um, there's a lot of questions in there, but I'm sure you get it. Okay. Through the chair to Councillor Hemmons, that is going to be our big challenge. And I would say what we have with us is a balance between the statistically valid survey to say, okay, here's where we heard from everyone, the majority of people wanting to see this improvement here or this type of change or us addressing these priorities. And we have that grounding in both the statistically valid in particular, where there's a discrepancy with the online. And then we also have to make sure that where there are voices that maybe those details weren't captured in the survey, that we bring those in too. And ultimately, it will be your job as the steering committee to tell us whether you think um, what we're doing in the scenarios provides for the range of priorities that the community are saying they want addressed. And um, that is going to be the big challenge for ourselves as staff and the consultants to come back to you with and look for your guidance on. So it is something we are keenly aware of and the expectations are high and um, we will do every, our best to meet them. Add on a piece of um, coming from the Community Engagement Task Force, this is a massive undertaking and during a pandemic I just want to express my gratitude to everyone who's involved. Um, I'm really proud of this work. I would also like to echo Councillor Hemmons. Uh, this has been a tremendous job and, and you're only literally a third of the way through. Um, I, special thanks to all the people who have participated and, and gotten us this far, so very much so. Um, I do have a question regarding the moratorium on OCP amendments. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple that I, I know of that are, I think are in the, two, in, in the dockets to get done. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say, uh, but 
how would that affect some of the bigger ones that we know about? Um, so we, we have some major ones in the works, and this is part of our scenario development. If we know we have something like up to 40,000 people to accommodate in the next 25 years, part of our role is coming back to you and saying, what's worked well over the past few years? We know from our last OCP that we're finally getting growth in our urban nodes and our corridors. What are the implications? So this one thing I didn't mention in phase two, a key part of what our consultants are going to do for us is modeling. So what are the impacts on our climate change priorities, our accessibility priorities with different land use scenarios? So if we choose to say densify one area of town over another, what impact does that have? Um, many of you who lived in Nanaimo many years ago will have seen the impact Woodgrove Mall would have had on the downtown. So things like, I'll use a term like leapfrog development, what impact would it have if we start a new urban node somewhere else? What impact does that have on accommodating growth? Will it have a negative impact in other areas? And so all of those pieces are part of modeling that we're going to be working through you um, through a charrette, which is a fancy word for a workshop, basically, on understanding the implications. So a bit like SimCity. So if we do X and put so many thousand people here, what are the impacts on infrastructure costs? What are impacts on our intended uh, walkability of neighborhoods? Uh, what's the impact on um, need for different recreational and other uh, cultural facilities within walking distance, all of those factors, uh, it's our job to come back to with the technical analysis of the options and the long-term costs, the environmental costs, the social costs, and the infrastructure costs, all of which are linked. And so that is a huge part of why phase two is the most critical phase of this process is um, modeling how that would look and how we would accommodate growth in a way that uh, maintains our various um, social and environmental priorities and understanding um, the measures that help us evaluate whether one option scores better than another. So I, I hope I'm distilling uh, that as best I can. It looks like Mr. Lindsay's going to jump in. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, just to just add on to that, um, I just want to be clear, we have a number of OCP applications that are in process, and we would consider those in stream. So we would, yeah. as Ms. Bopal Singh said, we would either find a way to incorporate those into the scenario options or to mm -hmm. have council uh, adjudicate those separately. What we're talking about is um, the plan right now allows for two times a year that people can make applications. And what we would be suggesting is that for 2021, we take a pause on new applications while we're developing these scenarios. It's a pretty standard approach um, the municipalities would take. It's what we've taken in the past. We do need to bring that forward to council for a separate decision on, on that item, but we expect in the near future to uh, come forward and, and seek, seek your direction on that item. But it'll be for new applications only. Yeah, th thank you. I was uh, my my concern was for applications that are already in the stream. We're not going to mm -hmm. delay them a year or something like that. Okay, excellent. Your worship. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I just wanted to express my thanks and echo what's been said already. Uh, very impressive, and uh, I'm find all of the information that's contained in, in what's been done today extremely useful in terms of guiding certainly me about my thinking and, and what priorities are for the community. So, thank you. I don't have anybody else on the list. I do now. Councilor Gilsenbrock. Thank you, Chair. Uh, through you to staff. Uh, first off, great work. Um, it was really interesting to read um, the uh, report with all the stats and sort of the feedback from people. Um, one uh, comment is was, was brought up just about uh, reflecting back uh, to the community what we've heard. Um, <clears throat> It would be interesting, you know, having some communications and probably that's already planned uh, with some of the, the major findings that goes back. I could see uh, useful uh, Facebook memes uh, with uh, some of these uh, stats uh, just to see, yeah, so that the community can get an idea what, what everybody's saying around them. Um, and I'm sure that would be part also when we, when we start uh, presenting the scenarios. Um, in conversations with, uh, at the committee table, like in the environment committee, um, 
with uh, downscaling the donut and mm -hmm. coming up with the uh, indicators and, and, and goals. Um, I, I think having uh, clearly articulated goals that can match uh, what the scenarios that we're presenting um, to the community so they can choose sort of what, what are the goals so that it's clearly defined that you know, we're, this scenario represents these set of values and goals that we're trying to achieve and then um, having that uh, reflected in a set of indicators that we can track as we're going through the years going mm -hmm. forward and we've had this discussion at the, at the Environment Committee um, and utilizing the Environment Committee to support the initial development of um, those, those indicators and it came up in that conversation just to bring the rest of council on uh, up speed, but um, about utilizing the other committees and task forces that we have to, to work on the social indicators, economic indicators, um, the, the community inclusive uh, committee, um, and, and then maybe have you know, some way of having a broader conversation that can integrate these, these goals uh, together. Uh, and, and, and using the committees as a way to sort of provide that initial community input in the development so that we can have a nicely dialed package that can go out to the broader community to assess, you know, are these the things that we want to achieve as a, as a community? This is how we can do it. And these are the, the land use scenarios that will reflect uh, meeting those goals. So those are things that were discussed. Um, and, and yeah, I really hope that that's the approach that, we're, that we'll be taking. And, um, I, yeah, I'm really proud of what's been done and the direction it's going and, and the amount of marketing. It, it is funny um, how prevalent Reimagine is around and, and I, I just, I love how kind of organically we've come across this rainbow uh, uh, logo and I, I think it really does speak a lot about the intentions that we do have in this community and I'm, I'm happy to see it around. So I'm, I look forward to putting this uh, on my, not my car, my e-bike. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Councillor. Um, those actually colors of the rainbow aren't in the right order, but that's fine. That's <laughs> um, we're at the um, end of phase one, um, and I, I see here the winter and summer of 2021 for phase two. Um, would we expect to be all here again um, near the end of the uh, summer then, like early fall? In terms of phase two, we, we, we're going to come back to you every two weeks at a GPC for quick updates. So the steering committee, you have lots of opportunities in between to give us guidance. Um, you know, I beg your pardon, Chair. I think, were you asking about the fall winter engagement? No, or? I'm just asking is the next time we all get together with, with here, it'll be, uh, it'll be at closer to the beginning of the fall, I'm guessing, no, at, at the end no, of phase no. two? I beg your pardon. It will be right in phase two. We are hoping to workshop with you quite soon in April, May. And in fact, uh, we're hoping to come back to you at a GPC with a city portrait to get your initial feedback on what a short list of some indicators could look like using the donut downscaled framework, and then use that to go to the committees for validation and refinement so that you at least get the opportunity to give us feedback before we go too far along. And I think that's really important that um, we don't want to truck along and you say, well, actually, that's not how we were envisioning this. So we hope to come back to you at uh, ideally the next GPC with a framework of how we can evaluate what our goals are and articulate that in some initial indicators for consideration. So um, it, it'll be in two weeks time Great. and regularly. You. You'll get a lot of staff uh, opportunities to give us guidance. Thanks. I don't see any other questions. Uh, well, thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to move on now to um, number five. I can't read my glasses here. It says here five B, but um, that comes after C. <laughs> Governance and management excellence continued. Oh, I see. We're continuing five B. Wait here. When it's produced by uh, Mr. Rudolph, we're going to be reviewing um, our annual review of the strategic plan. Your Worship, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm sure you're excited to hear this after two and a half hours of uh, committee meeting this afternoon, but uh, 
at least we'll get it on a table today and see which path you want to go forward with this this conversation so uh, just part of good governance where you do an annual check-in on your strategic plan and have a conversation uh, about it and where we're at in terms of the deliverables um, and uh, what kind of a process you want to go through here today or over the next little while in terms of reviewing each of these or any part of this. So uh, included in the materials uh, is the reference to last year's review, uh, which was about a year ago. We actually uh, had a facilitated session with a consultant. It was uh, the first year after you had come in, you did your strategic plan within the three or first three or four months of being here, and uh, it was quick. And uh, you know that afforded you a chance uh, last winter to validate or not the strategic plan. This year, you're in year three. Do you want to still go through that kind of process, or do you want to literally uh, have a less robust review process of this? And uh, so that's one of the that's one of the question marks in this is, um, you know, how, you know, what kind of session do you want to have, or are you talking robust change, uh, some uh, updates? Yeah, or that type of thing. So that's really uh, the, the uh, business plan for the CIO was attached only because it was a more recent uh, update of things that are in the queue and it's a summary of a lot of things in the corporate side of things. Uh, it also has a more refreshed list of the two or three pager at the back of the strategic plan with all of the projects. So that's the, that was the current version as of the early part of October when that was written. Um, so that's that's in the queue and also there's an additional set of information uh, on governance for your consideration it's you know, fresh uh, in terms of governance uh, information that we did receive from mr. Cuff uh, which is for your you know it's not uh, necessary to have this but it was sort of it's his you know if you you ask a consultant what he thinks is important he will give it to you and he did and uh, we said this is something he thought council might want to consider as part of its governance uh, tweaking to that section of the report. So, um, you know, it's really here to get a sense from council of what approach you want to take in terms of this document. Do you want to spend some time uh, rethinking it? Uh, do you want to more or less uh, adjust it with some updates? Uh, for example, the, 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 do the donut concept, uh, how does that fit into this? The other thing uh, His Worship mentioned today, which I, it wasn't part of this, but it could easily be part of this, and it's often part of this, is if you really want to boil this down even further, are there, is there a top five list or a top eight list or something like this that you really, as a group, want to focus on? Um, you no, know, very well, a facilitator uh, that does that and uh, does a top five list with a two or three in obeyance and it gets you through this process of working it down to that level and then you're really focused on those are the accomplishments you want to make so we don't need an outside facilitator to do that we can do it ourselves I think but uh, so it's just a matter of <clears throat> doing a check-in with you are you are you generally happy with things uh, I think at the his worship and I were talking I think this morning about looking at this draft plan a strategic plan in the context of the information you just received <laughs> Uh, in the uh, sort of from the community and you know is there an alignment there or is there something that's informing out of that information that you'd want to draw into this document so it's really completely up uh, for your uh, views on what next step so um, if we can get some sense of clarity out of this meeting today it's either everything's great with some modifications or do you want to do a, a bigger review or or what it wouldn't be typical to do that after the year in year three of a mandate. I think it would be more of a, I would anticipate it more of a managed process and, and, you know, just, you know, because uh, we're running out of runway in this term to, to actually make major course corrections, but it's always possible. So whatever way you want it, I, I just throw it back to council in terms of what do you think? What would you like to do? Do you want to spend a dedicated afternoon to just this and unpack it even further again and do sort of what we did last year? Or are you uh, more, uh, happy with a, a more of a targeted conversation about certain elements of the plan or or whatever so right now it's just here and uh, we'll seek some guidance or some consensus and then we could move forward from there thank you uh, first up we have his worship uh, thank you very much chair i uh, i thought a lot about this over the weekend reading material and and reflecting on mr cuff's comments uh, and our discussion that we had with him 
uh, where there seemed to be a perhaps more concern or criticism or commentary about the nature of our strategic plan than I'd actually anticipated. Um, having said that, um, I'm not sensing, and that's why I'm so anxious to have this discussion, I'm not sensing a great desire to pivot from what we're doing particularly um, on reflection. I think the plan reflects what most people in this community, I think, seem to want or expect from Council. Um, I think we're generally on the right path, but um, I would very much look forward to comment, criticism, advice, whatever from Council about how they feel about the strategic plan. Um, I think we have an awful lot underway, which is what I said earlier today, in terms of potential projects, uh, from a, certainly from a capital perspective. Uh, the relationships we have uh, in terms of building this community and, and bringing this community together, I think are uh, moving along quite well. I mean, this week we'll be having discussions with Sinemic and the port, uh, which are all important. So um, I, 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 uh, I'll be surprised but not offended if, if anyone profoundly disagrees with what I've had to say. But I think it's important that we have this discussion and, and to bring it forward to talk about it. Uh, are we sort of where we think we should be or want to be? And, and if we're not, then speak now. Speak now. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll go next. And, and I uh, uh, will say that I basically agree with the Mayor's comments. I think based on what we heard from the CUF session, I, I, and others can disagree with me. I didn't hear great enthusiasm for our strategic plan, but I, I didn't hear anybody really saying it was unacceptable. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's a good basic document that identifies uh, main theme areas, and we have uh, re-examined it uh, once already. I am not particularly interested in spending much, if any, time doing that again. I think we have a lot more immediate uh, priorities and, and goals and projects uh, that we uh, need to deal with. And the reimagine the NIMO process to me is much, uh, much more top of mind than going back to revisit uh, the generalities of our strategic plan. Um, so that's, that's my thought. It, uh, it is general. I'm okay with that. Um, the one Excuse me, the one thing I would comment on is the, um, the document that Mr. Cuff provided the Council Covenant regarding governance, which uh, I thought was a, a very useful document and, and I wouldn't object to Council um, talking about that at a future meeting, whether it's GPC or Council. But beyond that, I have no interest in revisiting the, the nuts and bolts of our strat plan. I, I, as I say, I think there's other priorities that we need to move on with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair. I keep wanting to call you, Your Worship. You, you can if uh, you like. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's no secret I'm not a particular fan of our strategic plan. I, I just think it really lacks strategy. I, I'm not being critical of our plan in general. I think most local governments fall into this trap of, of saying we have so many services. Um, uh, so we need to make sure we account for them. I think strategy in that type of context is essentially saying, what are we really going to focus on or what are we going to focus on doing differently? And I don't necessarily see that here. So I would be supportive of an exercise that, uh, and I'm not, I think with less than two years left, it's kind of uh, a pointless endeavor to redevelop the plan. <laughs> um, but I, I do think maybe... Uh, Something like the, his worship talked about here around narrowing it down and just identifying, okay, with less than two years, uh, what are we really going to try to hammer down for the community and, and have realized? Um, I think that would be just be a useful exercise. Um, and I think ultimately it would be um, strategic in the sense of saying, hey, these are our focus areas for the final few months of our term. So uh, I would be very supportive of that exercise. Councilor Martman. Thank you. Uh, I have no issues with our, our strategic plan at this time. Um, I think strategic plans are just a broad picture of what your goals are and trying to align that your actions moving forward align with those goals. But I think at this time we have enough on our plate. As being stated, we have reimagined Nanaimo. 
Um, I know that we're still focused on our downtown and our waterfront and everything. I'd just like us to move on. Thank you. Councillor Gesselbrock. Whoops, sorry, I just bumped you off. Thanks. Um, I've got a question and then a couple comments. Um, one, the, the question is just the current uh, items that are listed on the strategic plan, um, for example, uh, under environment um, completed climate resiliency strategy or things that are ongoing and governance excellency, seek grant funding opportunities for federal provincial government for capital projects. Are these bulleted points still driving and how are they driving current staff focus? And is this document being continually referenced as a, a driver for uh, the work plans of that? <clears throat> uh, that's, through the chair, that's a great question. Uh, I don't think we've done a great job of illustrating the link back to the strategic plan on our staff reports often. Uh, and and uh, so I would say it is there. It's none of these are off off target we've gone out we go over them fairly regularly but in terms of demonstrating that and and the performance indicators are pretty high in this so it's it's one step similar to red green yellow <laughs> in terms of a lot of strategic plans is it on track or is it falling behind and so it's, it's this falls more in that category of are those projects on track or are those initiatives on track to be accomplished and many of them are multi-year and some of them are ongoing and so it's just areas that filtered out of the process so you recall we had something like 22 focus areas at the first round of this and it ended up being reduced to a smaller number so uh, i guess i would ask council do you feel that there's that these things are still valid in terms of priorities and I mean there's other things there's a million other things that are listed in our work plans and my my uh, business plan attempted to summarize some of those things uh, and, and uh, so uh, yeah I think we could do a better job of illustrating the link between the strategic plan and, and many of the initiatives that we're doing so it's relevant but some of it's ongoing so uh, most of these are projects that are in the queue so some of them, some of them, somebody said, I think in one of our sessions that the strategic plan is basically a way to package what we're already doing. And I guess one could also say the same thing for the donut <laughs> is that in a way it's a, it's a way to frame everything that we're doing and then and, and build it out. So I think one of the more interesting questions is how does that, that modeling uh, layer into this document? And uh, I think we're, we're still, and to, you know, we're still trying to figure that out. I think the, the folks that are working in the middle of the reimagine see a lot of linkages there, and it would be interesting to see how that looks. <laughs> and we do. I, I, I sat in it for part of the environment committee last week, and I saw a lot of engagement by the committee members on that, and showing performance measures and links and all sorts of things. So I think, I think it's starting to happen. So, um, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of ways I could answer that question, but. It's, it's an important document to have. It really does provide some fundamental grounding in everything we do, and it's important that we keep something like that so we have some stability in addition to build off of it. So I, I, you can't underestimate the value of boringness <laughs> in terms of, uh, of something like this, because it does give some stability and a solid footing to work from. Following up uh, on on that is that I think when I when I look at the strategic plan and these specific bullets um, like complete uh, conduct a downtown mobility study update community sustainability action plan th those are very concrete actions that I think that we have identified as being a priority and I, I see a lot of check marks and I and I do see the utility of reviewing this regularly see like are we actioning these things um, and is this still a priority? The things that we have in action, do we want to do that? Or are there other like specific things that we want to go ahead on? Um, and, and so I do feel some utility of, of reviewing this. Um, and also for a, a bullet 
that is linking, you know, under governance excellence and the application of the donut model is I think that for achieving governance excellence, I think that we can take this whole strategic planning process to a whole nother level of integration if we start meshing indicators and like these large goals to the strategic planning process to the specific bulleted priority items so that it's all being tracked and especially like once we go through this official community plan process and have broad scale uh, community goals that have been identified is like having these sort of internested these items internested so that it clearly goes from the, the the big scale goals right down to you know at least the level of um, specificity that council needs to be involved in in terms of setting priority initiatives um, so I would be curious as an item, in addition to this, is how is the donut model uh, being applied to the city planning processes and, and, and have that be a, uh, an item of priority under governance excellence. Um, a specific item for environmental responsibility um, that I still think is a priority is completing a natural asset inventory um, and I know that that's slated, it was either for 2022 or it looks like it is blue for ongoing for 2021, but um, I would still love to see that done. Mr. Chair, it's definitely a priority for us and it is slated and scheduled for 2022, to start in 22. Excellent. It's, there's some work groundwork being laid by staff at this point, but yes. Okay, thank you. And then uh, the, the final item um, is um, a discussion with, and it is an ongoing discussion, but just on the prioritization of how we're addressing homelessness, addictions, um, and that. And uh, we have a lot of items in the, the stream, and maybe we don't need to address this, but for me, looking at what we've accomplished in this term, um, and what we need to accomplish and what the community expects us to accomplish, that's one area that um, I would like to put more energy in, um, in, in discussing and supporting, um, even if it's around the messaging of, of what we're doing, because uh, I, I think we're still being looked to, to on, on, on our actions on that. So that's uh, what I have to share. Thank you. Thank you for that. I right, next have Councillor Brown. Yeah, thank you. Um, the homelessness thing is, to me, the perfect example of where our strategic plan is failing because we, we're doing quite a bit there. Um, staff, we've directed staff to do quite a bit there. We're looking at doing things completely differently, yet it was almost completely absent in our strategic planning discussions and in our strategic plan. So I, I, it shows, a, to me, a complete disconnect about how we've been going about some of our business, and I, it, it's neither here nor there, but I think it rests with council to say, uh, Okay, we, we adopted a plan that we're either we did not believe in or we're clearly not following. And um, it's okay to have that scenario, but I think it's important to understand how you got to that scenario and why, why you're behaving that way. Thank you for that. Um, further to that, um, I think this council is, is in a unique position of having done a tremendous amount of community outreach in consultation with the community during a time where ordinarily councils wouldn't be doing that. And I think it's important, I'm glad this particular item on the agenda is coming after the reimagined uh, work that was presented to us, because I think there's, we're seeing a lot of public input from the public that may not quite align with what our strategic plan is. We created a strategic plan two years ago and then the world decided it was going to do its own thing anyway. Um, and forgot that to uh, follow our strategic plan. So I think now is the opportunity for us to take a look at it, which I think was a fairly good plan to start with, and realize that a whole bunch of things have happened since then, and maybe tweaking things. Um, the fact that uh, in terms of what we heard earlier in the reimagined process there of, of 70 to 75% of the population considering homelessness and homelessness related issues as a priority, I think speaks lows to where we should be in our own strategic plan. And I'm not suggesting a strategic plan just keeps turning directions every two weeks, 
But I mean, these are some fairly big things that have come up. And we do, and we have now the opportunity to have heard from the public. I think that's something that we should look at incorporating into the plan to see whether or not some of the things they're working on should be maybe pushed up a bit or pulled back a bit. That's my, that's my take on this. Councillor Martinman, you're up next. Thank you. Um, just in response to Councillor Brown through you, I, I'm just wanting to understand you were talking about the homelessness related to the strategy, if I understood correct. I looked at, at, we did have this addressed, homelessness in our strategy under livability, because one of the things we wanted to do was proactively address social disorder issues, enhance public safety, advocate to support our community being in a, a safe place. And one of our actions was support the work and implement the recommendations of the Health and Housing Task Force to address the health and housing crisis in our community. And we know that really encompasses homelessness. So in actual fact, I think we had an action item and we actually did have it in our strategy. That's just saying. Thank you. I have Councilor Brown. Thank you. I could be wrong, but I believe that was an amendment to the second year, which is, I think, the importance of the check-in, because that first year, I remember Mr. Rudolph quite vividly saying, are you sure you guys don't want to include it? And we're all like, nah, we're good. And then we spent the next <laughs> three or four months establishing how we were going to tackle that. So to me, that's the importance of the, the check-in. And again, I would come back to, like, these are pretty big statements that you could fit just about everything under the sun in. Um, and that, to me, is not strategic. If, if you... If you can't look at it and say what doesn't fit in our strategic plan, there's an absence of strategy. Councilor Gessenbach. Uh, thank you, um, Chair. Uh, just to, to Councilor uh, Brown, um, I just, in terms of the feedback, are you suggesting, like, it is good that we review the prioritization of within our strategic plan or it, it needs to be structured differently? Uh, to allow for for um, some better uh, uh, prioritization. I'm just thinking, like, looking at the one that we do have in terms of it being an effective document to guide sort of uh, a staff work plan, um, you know, is it something that we should be looking at livability or under homelessness and addiction in our response and looking at different items within there to add and amend going forward or is it something that this your comments are to like address the strategic plan you know following term or whatever to, to restructure it so that it's more usable Councilor Brown uh, if you're asking me I, I my focus really is I'm curious about the reimagine and the donut and seeing how that unfolds um, but I am very supportive of his worships uh, what he put forward here of you know I don't to me, it seems unwise to start to unpack and chart a different course. I think Mr. Rudolph highlighted there's a certain stability here. Um, but I do think there's um, a really good opportunity to pick that top five list or try to find consensus on that top five list and, and drive them home uh, for the, the remainder of this term. Next term, it's up to that council to decide on whatever they want their strategic direction to look like. Okay, I have no more names in the queue. I think we, I do now. Mr. Rudolph. <laughs> Going back to the first topic on your agenda this morning, this afternoon, which was future GPC <laughs> meetings, it strikes me that you would be interested in a session in, well, March now, uh, dedicated to trying to come up with a top five or a focus. And I agree with Councillor Brown and Right now in my head, it seems like the reimagine is driving the link with the donut and, uh, and all those plans and that may be forging the plan forward for all of the rest of the organization. And then uh, if there are some critical few topics that you're really determined to get to in terms of getting traction, it's obvious that we've got a lot of things on the plate, but there's a critical few that are probably where you need to divert your attention and you'll want us to focus on as much as we can, be that on implementation of the the homelessness strategy or the ECDEV piece or the reimagine or some strategic capital projects. Um, 
and uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a list that can be created there and that needs to translate into stuff. You know, what are we doing? Uh, and right now there's a lot of things going on. And again, I, I was deliberate in trying to attach the CAO business plan only to remind us all and myself included of all those things that are in play. There's a lot of things and some of them are not, uh, uh, you know, sort of at the council table, but they're still there, you know, behind the scenes support of the IT department because there's so many changes that are necessary with our enterprise system and our all, all kinds of technology issues and then just business systems internally. So, uh, uh, just, uh, so I, you know, we'll, we need to, uh, maybe we can revisit this a little bit more at our next GPC in terms of planning that day out a little bit more and we'll give some thought to that and try to put some parameters around how to make that a, a useful thing. And, uh, but I didn't anticipate much more from today other than to get this on the table and, and, and get some sort of ideas of what you would like to do. Uh, just reminding myself that we've already developed our business plans for this year. And so you really only have one more slew of business plans for this entire term, which would be presented to you this fall. So, you know, we've got that, uh, we've always got the ability to to change and be nimble, and we try hard to do that. So there's a percentage of the capacity in the organization where we have to have for things that come up. And we, it's amazing that we've almost not mentioned COVID once here today. And that is such a huge issue for us right now, just managing ourselves through this, this thing. So that's, that's kind of comforting to know that we've been able to make that not the first thing that we talk about at every meeting, because there are some places in this country that that's all they do. Um, through my camera connections, I, that's all I hear about Ontario. That's all they deal with is, that's it. Everything else off the table. So uh, we're fortunate that we've found ourselves in our situation here. And it's, it's uh, so anyway, it's just, we, we need to remember that we're still working our way through that. And it has implications, particularly in the recreation side of the house. And you're starting to get some feedback that maybe we're not doing enough to get, you know, not enough swim laps and all those types of things. So, uh, you know, it's, a, it's not a file that's necessarily over. It's certainly front and center for us. So uh, I just, I think we need to remind ourselves of how does that layer into this? Because that's huge for, uh, for uh, the community and for the services that we're providing. So, yeah, but, uh, you know, any other uh, comments would be appreciated. Otherwise, I think we'll try to come back and re touch base again in a couple of weeks and then plan something out if that works for you in March on um, something to get to a more focused session. Okay. Thank you. We have another comment from Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, um, Chair, not to prolong this, but um, I guess maybe I see it slightly differently, and that is that uh, I don't mind the strategic plan being more general. I think everything that's in it has been identified as something that's relatively important to Council. And I want to see us continue to work on basically everything that's in the plan to some extent. Um, so I, would, I think I would be opposed or I'd be very hesitant to pick out five or six things and say, no, I want all our attention put on those. I think they're all important. And I think our day-to-day -day priorities and how much time we spend on different topics and different initiatives is in fact driven by day-to-day -day events and what happens in our community and the fact that COVID has hit us, and the fact that, yes, now homelessness and housing and mental health and so on and so on is, is a priority, and so we spend a lot of time on that. Um, but I'm okay with having the overall plan being general. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to comment on, Chair, is something that came out of the CUF session, which I, I think interested a number of council, and that was the, just in terms of semantics, uh, the term strategic direction rather than strategic plan. And I don't want us to forget that because I think that terminology is worth considering in how we approach this. Thank you. Thank you. And I think you had the last word. Cool. Are we, so Mr. Rudolph? Just, just one other piece, uh, Mr. Chair, and that was the submission by Mr. Cuff. Uh, if unless there's some direction from Council, I guess it will sit there as a piece of information for Mr. Cuff <laughs> until, you know, is that something you want to take to Council or is that still there and you want to mull that over a little bit more? I mean, it was really an adaptation to additional information around the governance piece. Uh, and it's, it's uh, completely optional and it's not suggesting any that there's a need for it. 
at this t stage, but it could be something that we could form a good foundation document for the new council in two years or something like that. So just uh, if there's any direction from or inclination, just leave it as part of the information that you've received it, and or do you want to see some more information, something more done with that? I think Councillor Thorpe wants to see something more done with it. I will, uh, Chair, and, and to to quote the, the mayor who has more than once used the term at the crass political level. Um, I think this council on the whole was elected on a, a mandate of uh, providing good governance to our community, and, and I think we've done that. Um, I think this is an opportunity to just reaffirm to the community that yes, we, we still think this is very important and we believe in the precepts that Mr. Cuff has outlined and just publicly state that and remind the public that yes, hey, we're still here and we still think that's important and uh, thank you. So I think, it would, I think it would be beneficial to us and the community to publicly um, at least acknowledge that document. And now I have lighting up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> His Worship, Mayor Crook. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, uh, for, for what it's worth. Um, and I'm not moving it because I'm interested to hear what people have to say yet, but I, I would happily move that we adopt uh, the Council Covenant. I, I think that um, uh, this is an exceptional Council in terms of its integrity, its commitment, its work ethic. Uh, all of the things that I uh, value in, in any public figure and in public life. Uh, but having said that, uh, I think Councillor Thorpe's words are wise today that we need to say it to the public once in a while and I, I think this document uh, uh, speaks, uh, speaks well to that concept. It's a reaffirmation of what I think uh, all of us believe. I didn't say anything in there that would strike me as controversial. Uh, and, and it's appropriate, I think, to do so. Uh, far better to do it now when uh, no one's in trouble than to uh, be looking around later for, uh, for something. I appreciate there might be concerns around uh, quote unquote sanctions and enforceability if you don't comply with it, uh, but there's nothing wrong with having positive statements uh, ab about what you think councils uh, should be and how they should behave. Thank you. Councillor Gesselbrock. Um, I think that we could make a great little video out of this, like each section, you know, everybody reads out a little bit, kind of like the reimagined one, that would be a hit. But I, I think this is pretty mom and pop stuff, like I think it's good to reaffirm the stuff, like I don't disagree with any of the statements in here and, um, you know, the community does like to know that council, where things are at and that uh, we're committed to serving in, in a good way and I think we're proving that and if this helps, then sure, why not? Thanks. Thank you. Councilor Brown. Thanks, Chair. Call me crazy, but I don't see why we need to do this. We have a council code of conduct that was what, early of 2019 that we signed. It was really meant to send that signal and, and, and make that commitment to each other. Um, I kind of would view it as like just putting it out there to pat ourselves on the back again of how great we function together. I just really don't see the need to reaffirm. I don't hear any calls about people having questions about how we're behaving or how we're, how we're functioning as a group, um, uh, even when they don't like the decision sometimes. So uh, I just don't really see the point. I'm, I'm happy to do it, but it just kind of seems like an exercise in, uh, I don't know, it just seems like a pointless exercise to me that I don't see the intent. Councillor Hammonds. Uh, thank you. I actually wasn't going to speak, but I'm, I'm going to speak in support of Councillor Brown's words because I felt the same. Um, this is full of mom and pop kind of apple pie and motherhood statements that I think we all agree with. We have a council code of conduct and I think it could be seen as, like, I would expect that the the community expects us to have good governance and that we don't have to continually prove that we're doing it. Um, and furthermore, I think this is written in, I mean, I don't oppose anything, but it's very Cuff-esque. I don't think it speaks to Nanaimo City Council particularly well. Um, and it, it would just be another pat ourselves on the back, we're doing a good job, and I, I don't think we need to do that. Thank you. 
And if I, uh, if I may add to this, um, sort of agree with Councillor Hemmons and Councillor Brown. Um, my, my, I guess my question is, is this council sort of responsible for setting up the, um, how we train the next council in terms of um, our orientation, uh, that sort of thing? Because this would probably be a, an ideal document for that type of thing. Well, through the, through the chair, to the chair, no, I wouldn't say you're responsible uh, for uh, the, the orientation for the new council. That would be the new council would really want that and staff would be there to tell them what we did the last time and all that type of thing. So uh, you could inform the new council. You may be the same council all over again. It might, uh, in terms of... Uh, what you think are good practices, so that is, you know, so it could be something that this could be included if you choose not to uh, uh, act on this at this midterm stage, where you're just kind of doing a review of on the governance side a little bit. Uh, you could it could easily be included as, a kit, as part of the kit uh, for the the new council orientation, and what is good governance, and there will be some change presumably on council. There always is uh, some change, and the new members would benefit from knowing that and. Uh, uh, so it's no, it's not the responsibility of this council to provide the orientation materials for the next council. You could certainly provide a report on what you think the new council should do, <laughs> and uh, they will decide if they accept it or not. I would assume the electric would decide if they accept it or not. Yeah. <laughs> Every, three <years>. <laughs> <laughs> Every three years, yes. <laughs> <laughs> council Gesselbrecht, you're up again. Uh, on the utility of, of doing this, uh, I, uh, given the other priorities that we do have to accomplish, you know, I, I am mixed. And as I read through these, I do appreciate the, uh, the culture and orientation to governance that are being expressed here. And I do think that is quite nice, nice messaging for the public to hear, uh, just to understand the type of culture and environment that we are trying to engender in the city and whether all of it or in part, um, even though it could, we might interpret it as coming across as patting ourselves on the back, I think it is important for us to express how we're operating and what we're trying to operate because a lot of the times we think we're doing a good job and, 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 and that we're creating that culture and it's a bit of a vacuum sometimes in communications out to the, uh, the public and what's actually going on there on Facebook and the dialogue that's happening and when I think of the tone and the cynicism and uh, on Facebook and these places where dialogue is happening on governance um, I do think some positive messaging uh, from people that are in a leadership position is important to have, and I'd be curious what that effect that would have. But that's my thoughts. Thanks. Your Worship. Um, well, this needs to come to a head. It's past four o'clock. Mm -hmm. I am going to move that uh, the Council Covenant be adopted by Council at its next regular meeting. Second. Second by Council Martin. Are there any further discussion on this? Councillor Hammonds. A quick question. In there, there is reference to a social media policy, a robust one. So if we, um, if we adopt this, does that require staff to then, is there a work order assumed with that? Which I personally would not like. We have a lot going on. I don't know yeah. that we need staff's attention on this. Um, Thank you, Chair, through you to Councillor Hemmons. Um, we have already drafted one um, in um, anticipation of possibly a, a Council Facebook page that um, we didn't pursue based on your direction. So we, we do have one. I don't know how robust it is, and it would have to ultimately, I think, come to you for, um, for an approval and or your information, at least. You'll need to be informed about the robust Council social media policy in order to abide by it. So there is a, a piece, that piece for certain, is something that um, is kind of the cart before the horse. Thank you. May I just follow up with yep, that? I, I think if it's, given that this was written by Mr. Cuff, this isn't ours, um, and it, it tasks staff with doing something that we haven't given them to do, um, I'm gonna vote not in favor of this. 
Okay. Thanks. Councilor Brown. Thank you. Um, in response to Councilor Gesselbrock, I, I don't think telling people that you're being a good person is how you combat cynicism. You do it by a series of good decisions and treating others with respect. And, and so I, th I think this best case, this is neutral. Worst case, it's just seeing it, it fuels cynicism. Um, so I won't be supporting it. Uh, and I definitely won't be supporting it written in the language that Cuff has written it in it. I, I think it, like Councilor Hammonds indicated, I don't think it, it doesn't speak to me anyways. And, and all these things at the end of the day are nothing other than unenforceable uh, uh, clauses. So um, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Councillor Martman. Thank you. I seconded this to get it on the table, right? Um, my apologies to Councillor Turley if I've never seconded yours. Um, but um, I'm wondering if you might, I, I can just see if we don't pass this motion, that it's going to be full blown up. That I, I, I'm just wondering if the mover would like to withdraw right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got another speaker. Go ahead, sir. Whoop, Doc, turned you off again. So what is this? What is this action? The motion entail in terms of action. We just we adopt this and move on. Mr. Chair, not to interject, and it's not my business, but it, I mean it is because. The whole premise around having Mr. Cuffey in at a midterm was just to do a gut check and you know, on the governance side of house. It's not suggesting there's a problem. And I think the concern was, uh, well, and this wasn't even asked for. It was his submission. He felt in all the business that he deals with municipalities across the country that he feels this is a good thing that they should do. You don't have to necessarily take it or leave it. It was, uh, it was, and it wasn't suggesting there's a problem. That was the other, the flip side of this. This is certainly not a problem uh, here. It's just a reaffirmation around good governance principles. And that's what this is the opportunity to do. If you choose not to do it, it doesn't mean anything more. I think people can read into anything, but it was just a symbolic reaffirmation of your adherence to good governance. And it's pretty well everything on this list that I can see is something that this, co this council practices. And it's just a reaffirmation piece. That's the way we took it uh, sort of at a staff level. Not a criticism of staff and certainly not uh, council uh, boasting uh, how great it is on governance. Uh, it's just a simple statement and, or set of statements. So, uh, of course, there will be people that read different things into it. But that, I think that's what Mr. Coff intended by this. So just... Uh just, just to follow up on my question, us, us, this motion is not directing staff to do anything. It's affirming these these commitments that are worded in a certain way. That's that's it. Go ahead, Councillor Hammond. You're on as well. Thank you. Um, so there is a, a bullet point in there about developing a robust social media policy, and that's what um, flagged for me. It, this, if we adopt this, we will be adding to staff's work plan. Um, and furthermore, to Mr. Rudolph's comments, this is, this is a symbol, this is a signal. Um, and I don't know that it's one that we need to make, honestly. We're, I think governance is fine. We had a check-in, Mr. Cuff agreed with us. We had some, and it's not a little statement, it's four pages of statements. If, if we're gonna issue, yes, we believe in this, I'd actually like us to write it. Um, so for me, this is just symbolism and we don't need it. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to call the question now. All those in favor? All those opposed? We have Councillors Turley, Turley <laughs> Brown, <laughs> Bonner, Hemmings, and Martin opposed. <laughs> the the moat. Chair, could you, could you let me know who was opposed again? I missed it with all that records. <laughs> Councillor Turley, uh, Brown, Bonner, Hemmons, and Martman were opposed. And, and I'm, I'm quite of the opinion, not opposed to the ideas of what's behind it, just opposed to the necessary of doing it once again. So, so the motion failed then, because was, that was five, right? Yeah. Thank you. Well, we like to say it didn't pass. It didn't, you know, it's a question fail. <laughs> Um, that brings us up to um, uh, items E and D, E and F, which we don't have any items on, and we're now up to the adjournment of our meeting. So moved by Councillor Brown, Hemmons, 
All those in favor? Any opposed? Please no. Thank you.